Jam. Woo. Oh, you poor guys. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Hang in there. I'm gonna try to keep them calm. I served in Buenos Aires, Argentina when the war in Iraq started. This doesn't even compare to that. <laughs> uh, so we're starting off hot. Not yet? We're streaming? Okay. All right, welcome everybody. We really appreciate you taking the time to come out here. We know the parking isn't easy and you had to wait outside, et cetera, et cetera. A few uh, housekeeping announcements. Uh, bathrooms are in the back. You can, or I guess they're just unisex at this point, but uh, don't throw the lid down because everybody in here will hear it. it it's just something in this building. So just be cautious with that. Uh, water bottles. And uh, please don't uh, squeeze those frickin' things when you get nervous or angry because they also echo and will pick up in the audio. So be cognizant of that. Afterward, uh, we're going to have uh, Subway cookies, chips, drinks in the back for fellowship. So hang out. <laughs> He's liking that. It's my, our pleasure. Our pleasure. Uh, the way this is going to work is uh, I'm going to ask each side four questions. I'll be sitting here out of the camera, and I've read through the questions many of you guys have sent through either Midnight Mormon website or uh, RFM. And your questions were great, and some of them, I mean, I was learning so much from both sides. Uh, but um, I had to kind of crowdsource, amalgamate the questions into... Uh, queries that I thought would be beneficial. Um, beneficial for learning and beneficial for uh, real expression rather than zing shots to try to ooh the crowd. Uh, not really interested in that. Uh, we've, um, so trying to make the questions useful and uh, additionally, this, this has been very difficult for the simple reason that these three gentlemen represent Mormonism. And you're talking about they represent nearly 200 years of information. And on the other side, we have RFM, and he represents not Mormonism. And so when you're asking questions, it really is an imbalanced load because I, we could ask them something like, what happened in, in uh, 1839 with Joseph Smith in his pantaloons, and how are they supposed to know? It's just a huge amount of information. So I tried to balance the questions out where each side are going to give heartfelt responses, hopefully informed responses. And the way it will work is I'll present uh, one side a question. They have eight minutes to respond. Uh, then after that eight minutes, the other side gets eight minutes to add to whatever they wanna say relative to what the first side said. And then it will go back to the original uh, side and they'll have three minutes to wrap it up. Then we go to the other side and I'll ask them or him a specific question relative to him and, and Mormonism. And then we'll go back and forth. All right. So that's how we're going to do it. Uh, I want you to know um, that I see all of these four individuals as my friends. I love each of them, all of them. And so I hope that you'll do the same, that you'll show them respect. Um, it's really easy to want blood, you know, especially if the crowd starts getting into it. So I would just appreciate it if you would show them all respect. And let's just try to make this an event where people actually give good information, we can learn, and then you can decide afterward, we can have a Donnybrook in here. All right, but while they're doing it, let them just do what they do. And I just really try to implore that. We didn't decide who's gonna go first, so we're gonna Rochambeau, best out of three, one, two, three, rock, paper, scissors between you, you two. It. You can have it, do you want to go first or do you want them to go first? Either way, you're the moderator, you choose. Flip the coin, <laughs> Pathetic. Okay, uh, yeah. Yes, please silence your phones and devices. And uh, I guess we're going to start with you guys. Well, actually, before we start, can I say something really fast? No, because I haven't started the clock. Don't break the damn rules before we start. <laughs> well, well, actually, I would like to. Uh... <laughs> no! 
You cannot until no. It's not, in fairness not, to him. Not, not until we okay. start. Okay. It has to count for your time, Stop brother. Because I like you, bro. I love you too. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me get like my principal. Wait, wait, wait. Take it. You said that. Oh. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me get my clock up here. You can tell me if you want. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Where's my clock? Clock. Stopwatch. You may say whatever you want, unless you want me to give you a question now. Well, I, I mean, I was actually going to lead out to the audience. There seems to be a lot of confusion as to how this debate came, uh, came to be. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, we had a very incendiary, I wouldn't say incendiary, but a very aggressive podcast called The Cruel Hypocrisy of Modern Anti-Mormonism, in which I called out a bill reel that I now see in the front audience here, okay? And uh, I challenged him to debate any of these ideas that I had expressed inside of my podcast. At which point he challenged us back via email, and then you can take this out of my time, I don't care. And then uh, I challenged him again to do any time, anywhere, any place, any recorded format. At which point he dog-legged onto this. But our original challenge was to Bill Real, so I actually bought a sixth microphone for you. And I think it would be only in fairness to your side, and assuming the audience wants it, that Bill Real participate as the original challenger, and the person that I challenged so, Bill, we actually got you an extra microphone here. Will you come and take it? Yeah, I'm good. No, friend. I'd like to see this show. Okay. Let's, let's have an applause for Let, let's, That's fine. I want to have some applause for the grandstanding. This is the that's great. Hey, 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 just you don't let, get to talk yet. I'm sorry. Keep you wasting your just time. Let, that, fine. Okay, just card. let the record show that your grandstanding. He was offered the opportunity and denied the opportunity. Okay, I got it. So now I'm back. Wait, I gotta make it clear. Um, you guys cannot talk over each other. If you have the time running, yeah, it's sure. yours. If Absolutely. You, you can't say a word, and you either, okay? So let's respect that. You guys ready? Yes. I'm ready. All right. Please speak to how and why you feel the Book of Mormon is wholly inspired writ from God. Include your thoughts and beliefs on origin, translation, errors, if any, and whether you feel there is an authentic material basis for the storyline. In the end, give us your best pitch for the book that Joseph Smith said was the most correct of any book on earth, the keystone of our religion, and a man would get nearer to God by, by abiding its precepts than any other book. Oh, that's a long left? question. It How is, and the questions are long. So, yeah. How much time do we have left? You've got uh, six and a half, five and a half minutes. <laughs> okay. I'll take the lead with this. All right. So for me, I believe that the Book of Mormon is inspired. It is the word of God. Um, it started for me when I was 12 years old. We were challenged by President Hinckley at the time to read the entirety of the Book of Mormon by the end of the year. And I took that challenge and promptly forgot it and remembered on December 28th and then started reading all the way through after First Nephi. Um, upon reading all the way through, I prayed about it, and it started for me with a spiritual witness from God that this was his word, and it grew from there. Um, later on my mission, I had the opportunity to read through the entire standard works of the gospel, and there was able to see the places where the Book of Mormon aligns with what I think the Bible teaches, and the things that are said in the Bible that sometimes are misinterpreted by other parties. And that helped me to recognize that Jesus Christ, as presented in the Book of Mormon, is the same Jesus Christ as presented in the Bible. I believe that the Book of Mormon is a testament of Jesus Christ. It teaches us who he is, it will lead us to a personal relationship with him, and you can double check this with everything that is said in the Bible. I believe that's part of why it's there, it's a secondary witness. This is something where God has given us witness in our heart and our minds, and we need to use both, otherwise we're selling ourselves short. And so that's the gist of why I believe the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. If I can go after, um, I believe the Book of Mormon is an authentic ancient record, but ultimately you don't have to believe that. But what we do need to believe is that we each have individual worth. 
and that the ancients, whether they're in South America, Mesoamerica, Egypt, Europe, that they had actual worth and that they had souls and spirits and that there are, there's a part of every human being that has actual worth that matters more than just what a self-help book can say or what an Instagram account can say or what a podcast can say. When you take away the divine worth of human beings, you relegate them to nothingness. You're about as good as a dog. You're about as good as that trash can. You need to have actual worth that's outside of this world. And the Book of Mormon is another book that teaches you who you are and why you matter. When you take those principles away, you have an incredibly sad, secular, postmodern society, one that we have now, one where the odds are stacked against us, one where the, major the minority hold almost all of the wealth, one where your children probably won't be able to pay for college and most marriages are failing because we've decided that secular ethics are more important than eternal godly ethics. And you can ignore the Book of Mormon, you can ignore the warnings, you can ignore all of the things that it tells us to pay attention to. That was God. It tells us to pay attention to, or, I'm sorry, blasphemous, right? Or you can pay attention to those warnings and you can actually look at what the Book of Mormon is telling us to look for in our own society. And maybe then we can save our incredibly falling Western society and our Abrahamic and Judeo-Christian heritage. But that's what it comes down to. Altars don't really matter. Nahum doesn't really matter. What matters is are we going to save what our ancestors built and what we enjoy? Or are we going to be cowards and let it all fall and have nothing to look forward to and have nothing to be proud of. Cool. About two minutes. Oh, I wasn't expecting anything. Okay. That's why we can't. Uh, the quick. question is why do I believe in the Book of Mormon? Um, it's simple because I've had deep and profound spiritual experiences with that book um, that are undeniably spiritual. And in a simple way, whenever I've applied its precep precepts to my life, my life has gotten better. And I held my daughter. Excuse me. I held my daughter when she stopped breathing. She had an 85% chance of death. And this is not a hospital money. It's a testimony that when you go to a place as a father, so deep, where you hold your child, as she may very well have gasped her last breath. A lot of the cultural arguments of God, Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith, go away. And you are left with just you and God and your understanding. And I believe that the most important thing the Book of Mormon teaches us is to recognize the Holy Ghost and have the courage to act upon its promptings. And every time I've cultivated, cultivated the ability to do that, my life has drastically improved. And I've had coping mechanisms to get through the worst aspects of life. And that inherently is divine. So my testimony is limited, probably not as profound as these guys, but it's gotten me through something that modern leftist secularism could never even attempt to try. And that's time. Thank you, Welcome. gentlemen. Uh, Radio Free Mormon, Aye. under the topic of the Book of Mormon, yeah. in your estimation, does it matter if the origin and or translation story of the Book of Mormon is his, a, a historical material fact? Um, since it serves, as we've just seen in the lives of these three young men, to inspire people to live lives that they find are in more harmony with the teachings of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that trusting in the origin story of the book does harm to those who accept the message? And if so, how and why? And if not, then why criticize the book at all? And also, do you believe that the LDS Church has been disingenuous to its members about the Book of Mormon? and uh, mainly the translation events. Yes. 
Well, let me start off by saying that I prayed my way through the Book of Mormon when I was 19 years old, and the Holy Ghost bore record to me in an unmistakable way that every single word in that book was the Word of God. And yet here I am today. And that's because after 40 years of studying, of praying, of researching, of frankly trying my best, I think I got the gold medal in mental gymnastics for many, many years until finally it became exhausting to me. But I will answer your question. First off, with the Book of Mormon, I view it as scripture. But I do not view, I don't view it as scripture to everybody. I still find things in it that are valuable. And I appreciate the fact that other people find things in it that are valuable too. I would not try and take that away from them. However, Demonstrably, the Book of Mormon is not historical. It is very clearly a product of early 19th century America from the very beginning to the very end of it. And so, the way that Joseph Smith portrays the coming forth of the Book of Mormon ends up being inextricably linked with its historicity. If he had said that he had found some plates somewhere, like the Kinderhood plates, and uh, he translates them, and then it's the Book of Mormon, then it could just be scripture without being historical, I think. Unfortunately, Joseph Smith has a story about an angel coming to him in 1823, and then every year thereafter on the autumnal equinox, named Moroni in almost every account. And this angel says he is the last of these Nephite prophets. And this is one of the problems, because the historicity of the Book of Mormon ends up being really, for most members, completely tied with whether it is true or whether it is inspired or whether it is scripture. Now getting to the last part about, uh, oh yes, the church has been so disingenuous with everybody about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And at the time that Joseph Smith translated it, everybody around him knew exactly what was going on. They knew that he was taking his seer stone which he had used in multiple treasure digs throughout the decade of the 1820s. He was very popular. I'm not sure he ever found anything, but he always had a good story as to why it was that he didn't find the treasure, right? And he kept people wanting to find that treasure. I think of it as the 1820s version of the the lotto, right? You always hear about people winning it, but maybe you don't actually know anybody. So you want to go out there and you want to try and find it. Well, the church has known this forever, that this is how he dictated the Book of Mormon, and yet for the last century, until the essays, until the word got out, right, until the word got out, they have portrayed it as Joseph Smith looking at the plates themselves and translating the actual characters that were actually written on the plates. And then, when the word got out to too many people, what's my time, Sean? You're doing good. When the word got out to too many people, it achieved critical mass that people were finding out that actually Joseph Smith was taking his seer stone that he used in treasure digs, putting it in his hat, putting his face over the hat. By the way, the exact same thing he did when he was trying to locate treasure. Exactly the same modus operandi. And then he's dictating the text of the Book of Mormon out of his hat. The church has known that since the very beginning. And yet, it was only when it achieved critical mass and too many people knew about it that 2015 comes along and they take the seer stone out of the church historian's vault where the church had had it, right? They knew it was there. They bring it out for a photo op. I think it was the October Enzyme magazine. And then they put it back in the safe. Um, So they knew, and then when they find out, the members find out that the church hasn't been straight with them, then what the leaders do is they blame the artists. You all have heard that, right? Oh, well that's those artists' fault. We got some rogue artists out there who are uh, painting pictures that have nothing to do with how the Book of Mormon was translated and somehow sneaking them into the pages of the Enzyme, into the Sunday School lessons, everywhere. They're on the meeting house walls, or at least they used to before they started focusing on Jesus. You know, this is a real, uh, these are the real Gaddy and robbers, is the artists, okay? And then they blame the artists, it's their fault, and then we are in the clear in some way. No, they have been totally disingenuous about the way the Book of Mormon was translated. They got caught, they put it in the essays, which are almost impossible to find, even if you know that they're there on the church website. I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, you talk about these essays, where are they? I try and find them on the church website. And I have to like, you know, give them a map because they're three clicks deep. They were written not to be read. 
is what the church essays were written for. They were written not to be read. They were written to be there in case the church got in a tight spot and they can use it as plausible deniability. Well, it's there in the essays on the church website. So I love the Book of Mormon. I love these guys. I feel a little bit undressed tonight because I didn't bring my bulletproof vest. <laughs> Our audience didn't threaten you. No talking. No. <laughs> but uh, those are my thoughts. I totally blew this. I effed it up from the beginning. What you happened? were supposed to respond with eight minutes. Yes. Yes. They were supposed to then have three minutes. Yeah. So now you can respond to what he just said. He'll respond to what you say. <laughs> I'll give you three minutes, and then you three. Go. Okay. So um, eight minutes now? Yeah. Okay, I think we can all start off by agreeing that artists are the main villains in history. <laughs> We've all seen that. <laughs> but, Carden, go ahead. Um, actually, it is interesting. Some of the first commissioned artists of the Book of Mormon actually weren't even members of the church. Um, the church actually went outside of the box when hiring them. So if you study the, the, the oranges of some of those kind of silly Nephi armband pictures that we all got used to growing up, there's actually a, a very interesting history there. Uh, I gotta tell you, RFM, if you're trying to convince me that boomers are the worst generation that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints ever saw and that the church is true because they didn't break it yet, um, I'm in full agreement. I think that a lot of these arguments against the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, specifically are oftentimes generational and cultural arguments that apply also to America at large. I think in our post-war wealth, a lot of America went on autopilot, thinking that we're all in this ship that's in a rising tide, all of us are getting rich, and there was entire generations of people that never had to sacrifice on behalf of their faith, and so they got very lazy, and suburbanism took over a lot of what modern Christianity is. And a lot of these arguments will actually be valid in the context of their cultural criticisms. And something that I wanna say though, is I think that the narrative that the church maliciously hid this oh, yeah. is utterly false. You have to construct it very meticulously to make it look that way. Um, I can't think of a single time that there is a document saying, hey guys, don't tell anyone about the seer stone. We're gonna keep this under wraps now. That didn't happen. I grew up knowing about, th knowing about this. I am from Canada, maybe it's different there. But <laughs> I, I don't know, like, I, I find it interesting. Because we all have different experience, I, I think it's easy for us to think that someone is saying, oh no, you know what, you didn't grow up hearing about this when I did. Like this was in enzymes from the 70s. This was mentioned by people. It wasn't the main hux, er, eh. it wasn't the main thing brought up in the narrative because the fact of the matter is the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. They weren't focused on the translation. I think that, I know Cardin talks about boomers a lot and derogatorily <laughs> at that, but I think they had a difficult job correlating a curriculum for an entire church. And I think they did their best with it and it can be difficult to do that. But I think even RFM, we've had difficulty figuring out even how we're gonna have this debate. I, I think like when we look at the records of what we're dealing with and how it went down between us, we couldn't even get our own story straight for how we all got here. So to have it be set up that the church knowingly, maliciously hid history from people, I think is a very tall order that gets overplayed quite a bit with very little evidence. And if I can tag on here for the last bit, um, I converted to the church um, in 2014. And by the way, how much time do I have? You got three. Oh boy, all right. In 2014, I knew about seer stones. I knew about Heavenly Mother. I knew about Kolob, because I saw the Book of Mormon musical. No, I knew about that before <laughs> that. It wasn't that hard to figure out. The age of the internet in which I was raised was able to cover all of this. I also knew and know now that we have a beautiful history of seer stones, which RFM referenced in a, in a malicious way. We know that Joseph Smith used a seer stone and he put it into a hat. And we know that that tradition came from Europe. It came from John Dee, a counselor to Queen Elizabeth. He was the, the high ranking member of the royal family who created the Enochian language and the Monus Hieroglyphica. He's the same person who took the Solomonian tradition from the Knights Templar that, that date themselves back to King Solomon. These symbols of folk magic came from Europe. A lot of you are looking at me like, who is John Dee? That's because they don't tell you who these people are. 
John Dee was one of the people who coined the term New World and was directly responsible for the 13 colonies actually coming to the Americas. We can, this is not just cutesy, crazy tarot card guy. We can actually trace how this folk magic happens and actually how it has Judaic and Kabbalistic roots. But to ignore all of that, to just focus on the cynical narrative of modern secular professors who don't want you to believe in God, who don't want you to believe in your eternal being, who don't want you to know that you have divine worth, want to throw all of that off the table and just make you think about a rock and a hat. The ring I'm wearing has a symbol that is Solomonian, coming from King Solomon. It's the same symbols that we saw John Dee have. It's very similar symbols to Joseph Smith's Jupiter talisman and things of that nature, which were part of this folk magic used to translate. If you think the magic or the weirdness or the stones of the translation negate the divinity, then you do not know history. You do not know European history, and you don't know um, a Solomonian history or Kabbalistic history. You need to look into those things because they're incredibly important, and we should not be cynical in writing off an important part of who we are. Time. You have eight minutes if you want them, and then we're going to go three-minute summary, three-minute, and we'll be back on track. Thank you, Sean. You're welcome. Uh, I think the main problem here with what Kwaku is saying is that uh, just because he knows something about the history of the folk magic that led up to Joseph Smith using it in early 19th century America, as well as many others, doesn't somehow make it true or make it work or make it real, unless Kwaku is actually arguing that John Dee was contacting spirits and angels and receiving real and true revelation as well. So apparently, yeah, he does. So um, I bet you uh, Elder Ballard is probably your favorite apostle since he used to sell Edsel's. Because it sounds like you'll buy anything. Um, I got that one too. I don't know what an Edsel is. I what got is that? that one too. You ever heard of an Edsel? So anyway, yeah. you no, know, this is the problem. This is the problem with uh, looking upon boomers and casting them aside and not listening to anything they have to say. Because I'm a boomer in that I was born in 1960. I joined the church in 1978. A lot of these people, uh, I'm not sure about Cardin, he's a little bit older, but uh, they don't know. You see, they don't know because they weren't there in the church in the late 1970s and the 80s when all this stuff was hidden and when nobody was talking about it. And even in the 1950s when Joseph Fielding Smith, apostle and church historian, who wrote copiously, wrote about the seer stone and said, Joseph Smith did not use the seer stone to translate the Book of Mormon. And actually, he made a very good argument. It turned out to be wrong, but he was making a good argument. He said, why would God provide a Urim and a Thummim with the gold plates for the purpose of translating them, which we read about in the Book of Mormon? That's pretty much obvious, right? and still allow Joseph Smith to use his seer stone that he used in treasure digs. Why would God go to that effort and then let Joseph Smith use, I think Joseph Fielding Smith called it an obviously inferior method of translation. And he had a very good point. Of course, that would just be the tip of the iceberg because then the next issue comes up is why did the Nephites have to create these gold plates in the first place? Why did they have to inscribe on them they talk about how difficult it was to inscribe on these gold plates, and it would be difficult. And then to carry them around with them, and Moroni's got to lug them from Mesoamerica all the way up to New York via Manti, where he stops to dedicate the freaking temple, according to Brigham Young. That's a long trip when you're lugging all these gold plates. So, and then he shows up to Joseph Smith, right? In the evening, he shows up in the bedroom, manages not to wake up his brothers. That was good because only Joseph Smith woke up, his brother stayed asleep while Moroni was there in that brilliant light with the kind of sexy robe open down, you know, into the bosom. No garments, apparently, for Moroni. And um, yeah, so all this stuff, all this stuff happens, right? All this stuff happens that talks about how critical these plates are. They have to be created, they have to be uh, lugged, they have to be buried, Moroni has to show up, he has to, and then Joseph Smith, for crying out loud, he's going to all this trouble of hiding them, right? Because everybody wants to try and find them. 
And I'm not sure, I don't think the church teaches even right now that the people who were trying to find him were Joseph Smith's associates on his treasure digs. And they thought, oh, Joseph Smith actually found something? Oh, well, part of that's ours too, because we've got articles of incorporation that says your percentage, my percentage, and we need what's ours. So all this stuff revolves around it. And then to find out that Joseph Smith, when he's translating the Book of Mormon, never looked at the gold plates at all. And for some people, it raises the question, how come? Why all this trouble with the gold plates? And then it starts to sound sort of like a story that Joseph Smith made up and that many people were willing to believe. Um, also over here, talking about um, uh, boomers and generational, generational arguments, things that appeal to different generations. There's probably some truth to that, probably. But I believe that logic is not generational. And common sense is not generational. Well, you can clap. <laughs> it was going to start, then it just stopped. <laughs> and I think, I think that people who are uh, 24, 25, excuse me, now, 28, 38, 12, I think they understand common sense. And common sense speaks to people because we're people and we all understand common sense. Sometimes faith gets in the way of common sense if it is misplaced. And the problem then is that you have to argue against your common sense in order to defend your faith. I went through that so many times. In law, it's called special pleading. I finally got sick and tired of making excuses for Joseph Smith that I would never make for anybody else in any other religion or in no religion whatsoever, or Brigham Young, or whoever. And I finally had to stop and say, I'm not being honest with myself. I'm not being honest with the facts. I need to treat these people, even though I revere them as prophets, the same way I would treat anybody else. And in fact, they should be on a higher standard of behavior. They should do things better. I know a lot of times the temptation, I've been there, I was an apologist, okay, for the church. The temptation is, oh, well, we're gonna make an excuse for this apostle for doing something wrong, or like, you know, Elder Ballard, right? Uh, the, Elder Ballard says that nobody in the church, none of the leaders of the church have ever hidden anything from anybody. Oh, what a whopper. That was like four Pinocchios on that one. And we make excuses for them when actually what we should be doing is holding them to a higher standard because they're apostles of Jesus Christ, or at least they claim to be. So those are my feelings on the subject. I hope I've covered everything. I will say one thing that I do want to say before uh, talking about Quaker and talking about loving other people, which I think is important. I can't speak for everybody, and I wouldn't uh, presume to speak for you, but my experience in Mormonism is that Mormonism taught me to love people, other people, in spite of who they are. And now that I have transcended and graduated from Mormonism, I understand that I can love people because of who they are. On the Book of Mormon, a yes, three-minute summary. A three-minute summary. Sorry, just to so understand. We're going to get back to the original. Thing. Okay, is this a response to RFM or on, yeah. a res on the Book of Mormon? Anything you want. Anything you want to say. Responding to what he just said. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, that's okay. what we should do. I know I messed Justin it up. Justin Bieber's last album was an abject failure. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so... It was actually kind of good. What, what we just heard, to me, felt like a bit of a rant. I want to keep this precise in understanding th the fact that you can, you can take a very cynical view of history and you can say, oh, he did this and he did this and he did this, and the history of the magic doesn't actually matter. But ultimately what that means is RFM just does not believe in that magic. He just does not believe in that divinity. From what I know, you don't believe in really anything. And that's okay. But this idea that, oh, common sense leads you to be atheistic or secular, it's just not true. Try this out. After you leave the, here, go to a Barnes and Noble and go to the self-transformation section and just look at the crystals and tarot cards books that are flying off the shelves by millennials and Gen Z. And I want you to think about that specifically because even though the secularist narrative has been pushed forward, People naturally still go to spirituality and faith. It will not go away. The magic does not go away. 
No matter how many PDFs and articles you write, it will not go away because there's something intrinsically a part of every human being that wants that. And when you take it away, you get sad. When you take it away, you become unhappy. I know there's a lot of jokes being made about Moroni's sexy robe or whatever you want to say, but this isn't really humorous. We're talking about people's families being split apart because of religion, divorce is happening. We're talking about children in schools, um, possibly taking upon a lot of uh, uh, transformative surgeries with gender and things of that nature. We're talking about very, very important specific things. Thanks, Siri. We're talking about very, very important specific things. And it's not really funny. It's very serious. A lot of ex-Mormons in here know, I, I know you know, the trauma of leaving the faith is not that funny. So let's treat it seriously. Our history does matter, and our spir spirituality does matter, and you can villainize the prophets who've created a pretty great church where you find community in just about anywhere you go, and you can say, oh, it's all lies, they're bad people, the art is bad, and now I have to, I have to defend bad people, and I can just love people now that I've left exactly how they are, because yes, everybody matters, we all get a trophy, or we can be real, and preserve what we have, and we can actually live up to what we're supposed to be living up to as Christians. The magic is real, the spirituality does matter, and your secular narrative will lead people to be miserable, it will lead people to get divorced, to self-harm, and do all manner of terrible things. That's the reality, and that's what we've seen. So we can laugh at it, or we can deal with the reality, but our society is falling literally because of the things you are espousing. Uh, hold on, wait, they got 10 seconds, 10 seconds. Um, I would just say I agree that you need to use logic and reason um, and that if the institution is strong it will stand and be being subject to that logic and reason. I don't think logic and reason can work if they are under the duress of hyper cynicism and my only fear with the modern secular progressive narrative is it cultivates a cynicism that We're doesn't done. allow common sense to truly function. Okay, yeah. you guys are doing really I'll good. Audience, my time. audience, be respectful. They're, they're trying to get stuff out. I know, you're, I know you like points being made. Please try to be respectful. They're representing your, they're your voice. Let them be your voice. You have three minutes for summary, Brother RFM. Oh, yeah, summary of what about the Book of Mormon? Summary of Book of Mormon and what's been said so far. Okay. Well, I agree with Kwaku that there will always be this desire for the magic, for the supernatural, for the religious in people. I think probably predominantly if history is any indicator. But just as sure as that, there will always be an unscrupulous people there to take advantage of it and to use that in order to aggrandize themselves, perhaps with money, perhaps with fame, perhaps with sex, you know, the three biggies that the Book of Mormon tells us about, right? So, I think that that is always, but it's, all, it's like um, P.T. Barnum said, right? There's a sucker born every minute. And I was a sucker for 40 years. Absolutely, I admit to it. I will also say about the Book of Mormon that even though, I mean, I've read it, what, 30 times now? Know it backward and forward? have passages, many passages memorized of the Book of Mormon. I think there is much to recommend it. But I also, earlier this year, read View of the Hebrews, which was a book that was written earlier than the Book of Mormon. And what it does is it shows what the common understanding in Joseph Smith's day and time was about the Native Americans, that they were descendants of Jews, that they came over here a long time ago, and then they became these people, these large people, Part of them were white, part of them were dark-skinned, and the white people destroyed the dark-skinned people who remained alive when the colonists arrived, right? And I realized, once again, that the Book of Mormon is exactly the kind of book that we would expect to be written in the early 19th century as a history of the American Indians. And I will tell you also that I hear sometimes from apologists, I mean, heaven forbid, I probably made the argument myself, that as time goes by, archaeology and discoveries tend to support the Book of Mormon more and more. Well, I will tell you, back in Joseph Smith's day, basically everybody believed that the American Indians, the Native Americans, were descendants of Jewish people. Today, nobody does. 
except for literalist believers of the Book of Mormon. Okay, thank you. Uh, will you put your microphone on the other pocket? Um, the, re the receiver. Oh, this thing down here? My other pocket? There's a short circuit in the, in the wire. Oh. Hmm. Okay. Do you have a cell phone in your pocket? Sometimes it interferes with things. No. Oh, I do. No, no, that's my wallet. Oh. Wait a second. Is my cell phone in here too? Oh, it is. <laughs> boomer. <laughs> I am such a boomer. And do you know when I got my uh, airline reservations, I actually printed <coughs> them out and took them to the airport too? <laughs> Here. I tell you what, if I can just, <laughs> hey, can you hold on to this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I don't even get the boomer jokes. That's how undetached. I have no clue. I don't, I don't know why that was funny, but it was hilarious, I guess. Does I, this backdrop look like the Partridge Family school bus or what? <laughs> hey, Nick at night. I grew up on Nick at night. All right, you guys. <laughs> LDS doctrine in practice to Midnight Mormon crew. Are LDS doctrines eternal in nature? Yes. If so, talk to us about plurality of wives, Joseph Smith's practice of it, and do you personally believe that the specific doctrine is in fact eternal and that it will be practiced after this life in the celestial glories by faithful members who choose to embrace it here or there? To add flavor to the mix, do you believe that Brigham and Joseph, even though the fleshly practice doesn't continue in the present day church today, are still sealed to all of their wives eternally. Do you believe that the two women to whom the present day prophet Russell M. Nielsen is sealed to will be his for eternity after this life? And then finally, and you can just take the zeitgeist of this and say there's a lot there. And finally, are you under the impression that the practice may someday return to mortal members here on earth? And if it does, would you participate in it if it was deemed Requisite for the highest degree of salvation. Do you want me to go? I got this. Part. You want to go? Okay, go for it. So I'm actually the only one on stage with a immediate history of polygamy in their family. My mom was a polygamous wife in the Moorish Science Temple religion. Uh, my mother fled when I was just about a baby to Texas. Um, I've seen the effects that intense small cults have on people. My mother lived it. I've talked with her about it. it. There's some crazy stories. And what I can tell you about the polygamy in LDS history and polygamy from really being one generation removed is that nobody understands it except those in it. So when we look at polygamy and we look at the way it happened in the 19th century and it happened with Joseph Smith, we can make a million assumptions and you can take the cynical assumption and you can take the positive assumption but the reality is none of us were there what we know is that some of the women were fine with it and some of them were not we can make an assumption and say oh they were coerced or we can leave it up to their narrative and believe their voices i don't know if it's going to continue in the next life but we've seen marriage transform radically in the last couple of years it wasn't until 2014 that the Supreme Court allowed met two men who love each other and two women who love each other to actually get married. We don't have this actual grasp of marriage that we think we do. Sociologically, we've seen it change and we're gonna see it continue to change. So unless you're a sociologist and a historian on marriage in ancient Samaria, Greece, Rome, Israel, and Nauvoo, none of us really have the most perfect understanding of it. But it does not mean that you can't li live a, a meaningful life. It does not mean that, you know, my, my mother's a testament of it. It does not mean that um, those who are involved in it were just evil, bad people. Because I don't think my father was an evil, bad person. So, you know, this is a subject that's, that's brought up to bring out a lot of emotions in people. But let's, let's take a step back and understand that none of us were there. And as someone who's one generation removed, I can tell you that any assumptions we want to make may very well be incorrect. It, to me, I can't speak for what happens in heaven. None of us even know that much about heaven. 
But if you want to make the assumption that Mormon heaven is horrible for women and it's terrible, then you don't really know what heaven is. And that's a purposeful assumption. So those will be insecure and discomforted by their faith. But we know that heaven is supposed to be all things good. And we even know that Mormon heaven has multiple layers and kingdoms that I believe two, two, a man and a woman will be in and perhaps even a man and a man. Yeah. I don't know why you clap, but you know, it's heaven, it's great. So th that's just what I want to say, that, that you can't be too cynical on this subject. And let's be quite charitable in understanding that nobody here, I'm assuming, is a polygamist or is one generation removed from it. How much time do we have? How much time we have? Oh, you have five minutes. Okay, um, I'll just say my two cents worth. Um, I really like the word that Quaker used of a ch charitable interpretation of polygamy. Uh, we all face it in a modern context, polygamy is weird, but I've always been a fan of history, and so weird things in history were nothing new to me. And um, I think a lot of our modern inquiry into pol polygamy is um, looked at two ways. I, I struggle sometimes when I, I, I believe you, first off, I believe you that when you're telling your lived experience, that you're saying that maybe you felt in the 70s and 80s that some of these things uh, were hid from you or whatever. Um, I would prefer to look more charitably on our ancestors as having been so occupied with the positive expanse of the church that they didn't get into the details. But I don't, I don't know what to think sometimes because my entire life, I've known about the seer stones. I've known about polygamy. I've known about the Mountain Meadows Massacre. I, 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 I look at this modern argument that the church is hiding something from you, polygamy included, and I just think every one of these weird things you've mentioned, from the kinderhook plates to polygamy to et al, because you're a lawyer and I got to use these cool terms, right? Hey, I got a wink out of them. So um, all of these, I could go into any chapel in our church right now and blow the dust off of that 12 volume set of history of the church and it's in there. And so I view that not as an indictment of Mormonism at large, but an indictment of us as a people and a culture for not having taken seriously the inquiry of our faith. And I think we should, weird stuff like polygamy included, because it shows us that as flawed individuals, we still have a place in history. We can repent of these weird flaws. We can fix them and we can do it generally through spirituality and modern revelation. And then in regards to the weirdness of polygamy, like first off, yes, I'd practice polygamy if it was with you, Sean. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, Don't second, tempt me. Don't second one right me. here, you know? The, the other one is I think we need to look more charitably back on it. A lot of our for, uh, primary sources are East Coast uh, authors who are looking for sensational headlines because polygamy, after all, it is sensational. And also when I read the original writings of Brigham Young and Joseph Smith, it becomes obvious to me, everybody knows the plural marriages, but nobody knows the plural brotherhoods. There were ceilings between men who wanted to be brothers. If I loved Brad, because I'd served with him, both in a mission and maybe in a war or something, I could seal myself to him as a brother. And it becomes plainly obvious that there was a very wide breadth of non-sexual element to polygamy. And Joseph Smith was trying to create a worldwide universal human family because he viewed that as most beautiful gift God gave us. So I think we need to be more charitable when we look into our historical inquiry of what polygamy was. And I'll be real brief with this, but I believe that the doctrines are eternal, 100%. You see them in the Old Testament. You see polygamy was practiced at a time. You have it talked about in the Book of Mormon that there are times that God allows for this, uh, times that God encourages it and commands it. I am personally descended from polygamists. And I think if I were asked to live the law of polygamy, I would do exactly what my first polygamous ancestor did and talk to my wife about it, pray about it to know about what is the true thing we should be doing and try to find what it is that we need to be doing. Because I, I think we get this weird idea that God wanted for us to have an easy church. I don't know why there is a milieu there that people are like, why would he let this happen if this is so difficult? Jesus literally said to people like, this is a hard saying if you can hear it. I think that this is a difficult thing for us to deal with. And that is one of the hallmarks of the true church of God, that there will be difficulty, but we need to wrestle through those things in order to grow and become better. 
Hey, Sean, can I ask a question? You um, have uh, 50 seconds. Yeah, so um, I guess what's interesting about polygamy is whether you, no, I'll let you have some of my time, because honestly, this is a legit question, is that, um, <laughs> now I get it, it was delayed, bro. Chemo <laughs> brain, <clears throat> chemo brain. Um, polygamy's weird, let's just face it. There, you got your sound bite. Um, especially in a modern context. I only believe it was ever instituted when God wanted to raise up a righteous generation, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the 1800s. And my fear as I look at what leftist secularism has done to our country, there's only two states that actually have a replacement birth rate right now. It's South Dakota and Utah. Now, Utah is not polygamous, but it still has that cultural push of having children and creating more family units. So I'm curious, just from your standpoint, because I, I really want to know this, this is an honest question, is if the alternative to religious traditional family is the society we're living in now, however you want to call it, how are we replacing ourselves? Because that which is not sustainable won't sustain itself. And we're there, like, uh, actually over. But okay. I, I want to thank you so far for your honest answers and answering the questions. I really do. And it's, it's, it's going well. You have eight minutes to respond to their question. Thank and you. the question I gave them. Go ahead, my brother. I'm of the firm opinion that it would probably, probably be best if a lot of our society did not replace itself. <laughs> <laughs> Over 50% of males don't reproduce right now. Well... Something also that you had mentioned, uh, Cardi, which was a classic apologetic trope, which is that when you get blindsided because the church has not been telling you stuff, has been hiding it, what was it that uh, Elder Ballard and uh, President Oak said in that face-to-face -face devotional promo, right? Says, uh, oh yeah, some of these questions are uh, really, really tough, right? And then uh, Elder Ballard says, those are the questions that we'll avoid. He actually said it. That's when you say, oh my gosh, I can't believe he said it. That's what they do. They avoid the tough questions. They give you the milk before the meat. The milk before the meat, isn't that funny? The funny thing is, I've lived for 40 years, they never get to the meat. It's always like that 1980s commercial, where's the beef? Well, they keep promising it. And they say it's in the temple. And then I went to the temple. And I tried to love the temple. I really did. I went there the first time in November of 1979 in Provo Temple, right after I got to the MTC. I tried. I really tried. But then, after so long and after reading apologists talking about, no, it's not masonry, no, it's not masonry, no, it's not masonry, well, guess what? It's masonry. <laughs> it is warmed over masonry. It's like there's a guy out front saying, get your masonic rituals, get your warmed over masonic rituals and a program. That's really all it is. And uh, the same movie, it's not that great the first time. I gotta tell you, okay? Maybe you like it. If you do, God bless you. But it was a good thing they had people standing up and sitting down all the time. Otherwise, it's Snoozeville. All right, so anyway, that's that. But what Cardin was saying was this great trope. I got off on a tangent, believe it or not. It's perfect, okay? It's always our fault. That's the deal. Whenever we don't find out about stuff, it's our fault because we didn't study enough, because we didn't find the stuff the church is hiding from us. That's the deal. Remember the five rules that the church plays by? I can't remember them. I hope somebody here will, Bill. We're going to hide stuff from you. Then we're going to lie about hiding stuff from you. And finally, at the end, if you talk about the stuff we're hiding from you, we will hide you. That's what the church does. That's the rules they play by. So it is always our fault because it is never the fault. Nothing is ever the fault. I'm sorry, I'm getting exercised. Okay. Nothing is ever the fault of church leaders. Nothing. If you are a faithful Mormon and you do what you're supposed to do, and we know this because the church leaders tell us that it is wrong to what, everybody? Even if, by the way, just so everybody can hear it, because I know we're recording, what everybody, I think everybody said was, it is wrong to criticize the leaders of the church. Even if the criticism is true. So it can never be their fault, which means it always has to be ours. And we wonder why 
There's so much depression among the Latter-day Saints, so much anxiety, so much toxic perfectionism. I won't speak for anybody else except me. And boy, did I experience it in spades. Because no matter how much I did, it was never enough. It was never good enough. And there was always talks being given, whether in sacrament meeting or general conference, that let me know there was more that I had to do in order to be acceptable to God. I know that one of these over here, one of these people, I think it might have been Quake, who was talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Within the context of the Mormon church, please don't make me laugh. All right, the Mormon church is not about bringing people to a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's about bringing people to a relationship with Russell M. Nelson. And that's it. The church is there as a mediator between the members and Jesus Christ. You can't get to Jesus Christ without the leadership of the church, without the priesthood they claim to hold, without the ordinances of salvation and the ordinances of exaltation. But what they end up being is like the very same Pharisees in the New Testament that Jesus Christ told them, not only do you not go into heaven, you forbid anybody else to go into heaven too. And that's what I see over and over with the leaders. By the way, um, nice straw man, it's not malicious, okay? What I'm saying is not malicious. It's after 40 years of hard study and hard knocks in the real world. And that's sometimes what you get when you're a boomer. But the deal is this. The leaders are not trying to be malicious. Where's my time? You're at three minutes. Left? I own 30 seconds. Okay. The leaders are not trying to be malicious, all right? They are not sitting back there. Or was it Elder Holland who said recently in, um, oh, what was that fireside something? Oh, was it England? In London. Yeah, in London. You know, well, we weren't just sitting over there rubbing our hands this morning and thinking, what fairy tales can we tell the members of the church, right? Well, of course he's not. What the leaders have been doing since, well, probably since the beginning, is they are withholding, first off, they know the church is true. Let's start with that as a premise. I don't go along with people who think that, oh, they are Machiavellian up there and just going, we know this isn't true and we're just doing it for the money and the tithing and all this kind of stuff. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that the leaders of the church, just like me for 30 some odd years, knew this church was true and want to bring it to other people and want to keep members from leaving the church because your exaltation depends upon it. And the, the exaltation of converts depends upon joining the church and being faithful. Well, that's not going to happen if we tell everything that we know. That's why we're not going to tell you, speaking for the leaders of the church, we're not going to tell you the negative things of the church. Not because we're being malevolent, but because we're doing it for God. Because only in this church can you be saved. Negative information about the church will keep people from coming in and cause people to leave. Therefore, we will tell only one side of the history, the correlated, whitewashed, sanitized version of the history. And Boyd K. Packer was nice enough in 1980 or 1981 in his talk, the mantle is far, far greater than the intellect, when he was talking to all the teachers in the church, all the CES instructors, all the BYU professors, and he said it. He said, there's all this negative stuff about the church. You are not to talk about it. And you don't repeat it. It's like disease germs. And maybe you'll catch it. You only talk about the faith-promoting side of the church. And that's the context for the famous quote, not all truths are useful. Okay? So they are on record. In, and that was published as the first article in BYU Studies after he gave the talk. So they are on record. This is the plan, this is the agenda, and then Boyd K. Packer told all the professors and CES instructors, if you don't go along with me in hiding this stuff from the members of the church and your students, then you will be looking for new employment and you'll, prob you'll probably be spending eternity in a very warm place. All right, perfectly timed. I have a format question real quick. Format, yeah. yeah uh, are, are we saying what we want or are we responding to the topic? <laughs> Because I thought this was supposed to be about polygamy, but there is, that's why I, I it what was, are we supposed uh, to? This is what happens in the format when I presented, I presented you with a question about polygamy. You gave your response. He has a chance to respond and say whatever he's going to use his time for. And you have now three minutes to summarize. Yeah, I can't, I can't monitor what everyone says. Now I'm going to give him a question and then you can use your time to say what you want. Yeah. So you have three minutes summary to take that question. All right. 
I, I do find it interesting that you had a full eight minutes and yet still said so little about polygamy. I feel like there's a ton to say. Um, so I, I just... None of it's any good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Bill! Hey, I, uh, I'm a product of polygamy. I think I'm pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> With one so, exception, and that's you. So, um, I, I don't know. I, as I'm listening to what you're saying, I, I feel like you have unrealistic expectations of history. I think that it's interesting to look at even, like we talked about, where we are at now with this debate. It was difficult for us to even nail down a story that people probably don't even agree in the audience as to what actually happened to get us here on this debate stage tonight. We can't even establish that as truth. And yet you have expectations that the entire church should have a solid narrative the entire time. You talk about this as though you have people hiding history all over the place, and yet they just so happen to say the very things that on the record that you are now using to say that they're liars. We recognize that it is not the fault of church leaders. It, I, I think that's an oversimplification of it. We should not criticize church leaders, not because they're never wrong, but because being critical is unproductive. I think that when we look at I know it's funny to hear me say that when most of what we do is be critical, right? <laughs> like, it's here we are, it's human nature. But I think that when you look at the things being the fault of church leaders, I don't think any communication problem in the world is ever a one-way street. I don't think that the church tries to tell its members that it is 100% our fault if we misunderstood something. I have never had that impression ever in my life from the church. I have never had the church tell me that it is my fault that I don't understand things. I have had the impression that I've been misunderstanding, but it is not from the church that that comes. How much time do we have? You've got a minute and 10. Okay. Um, I guess my only question is sometimes I really struggle with these as well because I just think, where are you saying it was hidden? It, it, there's this narrative in, in ex-Mormonism that the internet blew the doors off of something and all of a sudden we could communicate and share these lies that were some kind of secret gnosis that was hidden from us before. But I, I remember in 1995, 96, pre-internet, doing seminary, where we talked about the seer stones. We talked about uh, polygamy. We talked about many of these, what I found interesting, and I accept it. I'm a weirdo. I'm the guy that will actually buy the strange historic book and blow off the dust from B.H. Roberts' History of the Church and actually read it. So. I don't know necessarily how to respond to that. And as much as, yes, I rip on boomers, it's a colloquialism that millennials and Gen Zers use to mean people older than us. I actually have a lot of respect for what boomers did. And I think some of these arguments are natural consequences. Did you know over 50% of the current membership of the church was baptized because of the standardized discussions that were accumulated and taught by boomers? And in the wild expansion and success of the church throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they went back to basics because the basics were good. And it was up to us personally to find a lot of those details. I don't see how with the wild expansion, every jot and tittle could be taught. We have to be more charitable to our ancestors that built this thing. We can't be that cynical. Thank you. Okay. Uh RFM, your question, you get eight minutes, they'll respond any way you want to what he says He's for eight minutes. It, we don't have to stay on topic. You, no, we, no, I mean, obviously, obviously you, ideally, yeah. okay. ideally, yes, ideally, ideally yeah. yes. And, and you, many of you have stayed on topic. RFM, suppose you can only talk about three things for a year on your program about Mormonism. Three things that you find absolutely reprehensible, unforgivable, needs to change, and people need to understand everything they can about these three things about the church today. You get three and put them in order. Number one, number two, and number three. All right? What will you, what will you cover and why? You have eight minutes. Go, brother. Thank you. I think that one of the things I'd want to cover, and which we do cover on a number of episodes, has to do with social issues. And it has to do with, uh, right now today, the reluctance of the church to accept on an equal footing in its membership 
gay people, lesbian people, trans people, and any other kinds of people. I'm sorry if I'm forgetting some of the, uh, the, uh, the different categories, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Every time the church seems to take one step forward, then something happens when Elder Holland gets up and starts talking about muskets. <laughs> and everybody goes, what? Especially from Elder Holland. I've heard from a number of seasoned members of the church boomers how disappointed they were with what was said, not only because of what was said, but because of who said it. They had an idea that their hopes were pinned on Elder Holland to be a moderating influence. And then he gets up at BYU in August of this year, 2021, for those listening in the future, and he starts talking about musket fire. And I know that you did an episode defending him on that. The deal is this. No, he wasn't saying go out and get your muskets and start shooting gay people. We understand that. The deal is, is that in an environment where in the church we have got extremely fringe, right, desnat people who are very willing to take up arms against the sea of homosexuals and by opposing in them, forgive me Shakespeare, Using that kind of language is not cautious. It is not prudent. And a good, wise leader recognizes the fact that there are people who will hear that message and may go out and do things that the leader would never come out and want anybody to do. You've got to be careful about that. So the other thing that was talked about over here about homosexuals, I mean, Quaku said the time will come hopefully when homo gay man and gay man will be sealed in the temple, okay? I think that would be great, and I think it will happen. But this is another principle of apologetics, one that I engaged in frequently and one which I see often, which is apologists for the church almost always create a different church than the one the church leaders teach to us in general conference. And then they start defending this fake church that they've created as if it is Mormonism, and then say, look at how great my defense was. Well, the problem was, that's not Mormonism. Mormonism has got to be, at least if we're looking at it, I think, at its basic roots, it's got to be what the leaders of the church are teaching us today. That's what Mormonism is. And we know that because we have to follow them and not criticize them, right? So having said all that, that's one thing. And also, another thing that was very shocking to people was in 2015, that was when the Supreme Court case came down, legalizing gay marriage, 2015, because it was right after that that the church put in that policy of exclusion, and it got leaked on November 5th of 2015. Next January, 2016, Russell M. Nelson says, that was a revelation from God, it was received by Thomas S. Monson, and we were all of us there present and privileged to sustain that as a revelation from God. Three and a half years later, it's reversed, and that's a revelation. Okay, That was hard for a lot of people to understand. And I can understand because apparently God resembles a dithering, somewhat senile, old man <laughs> who cannot see what's going to be happening as a result of this revelation he gives to his leaders. And the pain and the agony and the trauma that it caused so many people that three and a half years later it had to be reversed. So God contacted them again and said, hey, you know that revelation I gave you three and a half years ago? I've been thinking. <laughs> let's, let's not do that anymore, okay? So that is something, and that is something that happens in our own lifetime. It's not the 125 years it took to reverse the priesthood ban which is not in anybody's lifetime. You actually have to study to find that out. This, this change, people found out in real time. That was part of their lived experience, and they don't understand how it is that God could not see the future. I mean, even three and a half years down the road, that shouldn't be too much for God. I think it's too much for the leaders of the church, but it shouldn't be too much for God. So I was talking about that one issue. How much time do I have to talk about the other two? Oh, you've got uh, three minutes. Great. Second one is polygamy, is polygamy, because I think that President Nelson, who will have Danzel and um, Wendy for all eternity, you know, he's got that big block from the, um, 
the uh, Salt Lake Temple, that big block of granite with his name on it. Doesn't have an end date yet, but um, it does have Danzel's, and it's got a place for Wendy too. I've got a feeling that if you look really closely, there's also a place for Sherry Dew. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't know that that's true. But yes, obviously, polygamy is going to be part of the eternities. It has to be. And the problem with polygamy isn't that it was a long time ago or it's a long time in the future in the celestial kingdom. The problem is, is that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. He had at least 33 different wives. At least. People differ because the records were hidden so well. And, <laughs> right? That's why. And so they have to figure it out. And 33 is a baseline minimum. 11 of those women were already married to other men when Joseph Smith married them. And some of the men, he got out of the way by calling them, I'm sorry, God got them out of the way, by calling them on missions to foreign countries. Some of those, at least one, if not two, were 14 years old when a 30-some-odd Joseph Smith married them. Or was it 14 or was it a few months shy of 15? <laughs> I can never remember. But the problem is, is that when I learned about this, I was sick in my heart because I loved Joseph Smith. I revered him as a prophet. And to find out that this was actually true, by the way, good job, Fair Mormon or Fair, because they have that great website and people go to it and they're hearing all this stuff and they, this can't be true. And they go there and they find out, yeah, it is. And then they're going to explain it away for you. It's always the yeah, but yeah, it is true. Even Fair Mormon recognizes it. The church recognizes it. They had to put out an essay on it. And I will tell you that today when I was thinking about it, I thought about Nathan the prophet from the Old Testament. Because there was a certain guy who was a king, his name was David, and he took somebody else's wife for him. And he's got all the women that he could possibly want in the world, but he wants... Uz Uzza? No. Uriah. 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 He wants Uriah's wife. And Nathan comes to him and he says, Hey, I know this guy who had like all the sheep in the world. And there's this little poor guy over here. He's only got one sheep. And the guy with all the sheep in the world says to the guy with one sheep, I want your sheep. I'm going to take your sheep. What do you think about that, King David? And King David says, that's horrible. That's atrocious. That, that guy should be killed. And Nathan says to him, you are the man. You are the man. And that's one of the reasons it makes me so sad. Are we done? Okay, Book of Abraham was the third. Listen to Robert Rittner, 13 hours, done. <laughs> so I, I want to address, at first you talked about violence and about the brethren perhaps inspiring right-wing desnats to be violent. I also agree that the desnats are an issue in our church. Um, but 15-year-olds making memes do not compare to FBI crime reports of arson of chapels. We have people making memes. Your side is burning down our buildings. It's not my our side, side is not the Wait a second. Let I'm not going to stand for that. Time. It's it my is time. not my side. Hey, it is my time. It is not my, it's my time. Your, you side, are, your side. You can't do it. That's a lie. You're, you're a liar. You hey, get all right, the final say. I'm going to go. Okay, you've had, you've had a lot of time. Your side is the one that tried to sneak a porn star into our temple and make a lesbian sex scene. We would never do that. You say that your like there's something wrong with it. Hey, 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 hey. RFM, please. Okay. No, come on. We gotta be respectful, babe. We it's already know if we were living in the 19th century what your side would be doing. Your side would be the ones with the guns. Your side is the only side actively being violent. So you can be upset at some kids making memes. Hey, wait, or you can deal with the talk. reality. Let him that, talk. And again, this is something you guys, that guys come this on. This is something man. that the anti Mormon podcasters don't like to bring up, but you can look up the FBI crime reports and the heightened government security on our actual buildings itself because, again, this is the side that's trying to burn things down. This is the side that threatens us, sends us threatening messages and videos, which is why we're literally wearing this right now. So uh, I, I just want to I just want to give some statistics to what he's talking about. You guys can get on your iPhones as soon as you leave and look up a Wikipedia page of anti-Mormon violence. It's populated by FBI statistics that show there's been more attacks against LDS chapels since 2017 than the whole 200 years of our, our church's history combined. They're the ones that alerted us to a 15% increase since 2019 
of chatter and threats against LDS chapels. And when I go on ex-Mormon subreddit every once in a while, when I get that alert on my iPhone, I see all kinds of burn it the F down with truth and so on and so forth. And if you're gonna apply the same reasoning of Elder Holland's benign musket fire comment, then you would have to accept responsibility for the increased arson against our chapels and the violence against our people. You can't have your cake and eat it too. It either goes both ways or it doesn't go either way. What he's saying is true and that is not a straw man argument. These are stats made by a third party Federal Bureau of Investigation you can go look up as soon as you leave this room. And when you use language like, this is what the leaders have done to you, they are making you sad, they're making you depressed, what's that gonna do to somebody who is actually on the brink of causing violence. We've literally seen what it does. It causes people to burn down buildings. This is happening repeatedly, and it's this side that's driving that vitriol. I gotta say also, I, I, don't, I don't know where this don't criticize leaders of church came from. I think we're taught. <laughs> Get it out of your system. Get it out of your system. Um, I'm aware that having grown up in Los Angeles, not in the Wasatch Front or somewhere else, that I might have had a different lived experience than you. We don't make entire movies in Hollywood where I produce movies about small town America being different than big town America without it being based on some kind of truth. So I believe you when you say that there was some kind of cultural influence that may have been negative in your formative years. But I can tell you, anybody that's familiar with, your, with our show knows there's a healthy debate on what we agree and don't agree on. But one thing we agree on is the most important thing is what God thinks through personal revelation and the purpose of prayer and trusting in leaders, even if you may not agree with them, is for what we perceive as the positive building of the kingdom. It doesn't mean we never uh, agree or disagree and I, I just, I feel like I grew up in a different church than the one you guys complain about. Um, Brad, take it away, Brad. I don't want to take your time. I, I just want to say that I completely understand why you would pick these as your main three issues. I, I totally see it. Because one thing that I want people to know is that our side is not blind to recognizing that there are difficult things for people to deal with within the church. We don't just say every single thing that you've ever experienced is completely, like, just gloss over it. That's not what we say. What we believe is that God knows we will go through hard times. Some of those hard times will be because of things in the church. The church will be difficult. I want you to know that the only side that will ever tell you that things are never your fault and that you never need to do anything to change, that is the side of the devil. This has been from the very beginning what we have had a war in heaven over, whether or not we have responsibility for our own actions. This is something that we need to take responsibility for and recognize, hey, there will be hard things in this life. We have to recognize what those are and work them out with God. Do we have more time? Three minutes. Or are we at? Three oh, minutes. And, and, well, I just want to say on, on the subject of polygamy and really the idea of sexual ethics in general, if I take a look at the voices in Mormon media across the board from Radio Free Mormon, to Mormon Stories, to Midnight Mormons, to Saints Unscripted. I have a look at all of them. If I look at the faithful LDS side, all I see are people telling you to love your spouse, stay in your marriage, and build up your family. When I look on the ex-Mormon side, I find accusations of sexual assault from John DeLynn. I find uh, advocations of swinging with Bill Real. I find a number of quite you're insane things. I'm it's going you by got, your show. It's my minutes. time to speak. You're all right, thanks. You're gonna have thanks. three minutes. When I, I, okay, stop. can you stop? stop? Thank you very much. Okay, stop. so when I look at it, I can see the faithful side promoting healthy marriages and healthy families, and the ex-Mormon side promoting a lot of very bad stuff. You can you can go look at it on their own show. So I'm dealing with 2021 in real time. What you're saying does not add up to what you're living up to. What you're advocating saying the church is, it has done and what Mormonism represents it, with polygamy and sexual ethics, your side cannot keep their sexual ethics together. Why on earth would I ever trust what you have to say about Joseph Smith when the people on your side have been so rather degenerate and horrible in their own marriages and with their own women that are working for them? Minute 30, minute 30, minute guys. 30. Uh, to specifically Come on, address, you guys, a minute 30. To specifically address some of the things that you brought up, with the Book of Abraham, I would invite you to, as you go out and hopefully study what Robert Rittner had to say, 
maybe compare what Robert Rittner had to say with other things he had to say outside of the Book of Abraham, and you'll notice that he's not consistent with himself. He does not give you a clear idea. I don't think he was being unbiased when he was talking about the Book of Abraham. I think there are very important things within the Book of Abraham that you can learn very good, deep gospel truths from. And if you look at the work of John Gee, Stephen Smoot, you will find very, very good things within the Book of Abraham that prove that it is, in fact, a historical record. I think, to my knowledge, Robert Rittner is the only person that we have that's saying anything bad about the Book of Abraham. To my knowledge, he and it's imperfect. Him. And he'll defend it. Come on, you guys. He's your spokesman. And with the book of Abraham, I, I think that is the gist of what I want to get across. When it comes to the priesthood ban, I agree. It's a difficult thing to deal with. It's a difficult thing to understand. But it's something that we need to take our time and pray about and learn from God. They, they wrote these gospel topics essays not to try to brush everything under the rug and then hide it. You say three clicks as if that's a difficult thing to get through. It's right there. Time's up. And we're done. Time's up. All right. All right. Three minute wrap up on your side of everything that, that's been said. You now can speak. Thank you. This is one of the classic non sequiturs that the Midnight Mormons engage in. First off, they do character assassination on anybody and everybody who is a critic of the church. They make stuff up. It's and on I, your own show, dude. No. Nope. They make all sorts of crap up and then they lie about it and they trumpet it as if they have any clue as to what they're talking about. By the way, spoiler alert, they don't. These are the people who are talking about me inciting violence? Oh no, it's not me. Oh, it's the people who are on my team. It's other people. It's people sneaking people. By the way, so you know, yeah, it was a joke, duh. It was a joke. You say that like there's something wrong with it. I'm sorry I have to actually explain it to you. The old saying goes, if you have to explain it, it's not funny. What? Anyway, I hope some people here recognize what's going on. That's a bit of a train of thought that went before. But these are the same people. The irony is rich here. I'm glad I wore some high boots. Because these are the same people who retweet a video depicting in meme form John DeLynn getting his head bashed in with a baseball bat. And they're saying, oh, we're the ones who are inciting violence. These are the people, and Quaku did it tonight, my gosh. Making up, making up. Lies. Rosebud's a lie? Hey, 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 hey. No, hey, she's, hey, she's hey, mentally hey. troubled, and you should not be taking advantage of a mentally troubled person. Well, I'm listening to her voice. No, no, Kwaku, no. please go by the rules. We're going to have total chaos, please. Thank you. And talking about people having serial affairs based on nothing and going on your program and publicly proclaiming it as if it's fact, and then you claim that, oh, we're the ones who are inciting violence. You twist a compliment that I gave to you, which was actually sincere twist it into a lie, and then call me a liar. That's really low on the rung as far as calling John DeLynn a sex predator and Bill Real a multiple uh, serial adulterer. I think liar's way down there. But it's the same kind of thing. And yet you are the ones who are saying that over here we're inciting violence. These are difficult issues. You've mentioned difficult issues about polygamy or the priesthood ban. Difficult issue is code for an apologist, which means I can't answer that. There is no faithful answer to it. That's what a difficult issue is in Mopologist or Mormon apologist speak. I know I used to be one. So the idea is if we acknowledge it's a difficult issue and we move on to something else and hopefully you won't hold our feet to the fire. Okay? So, the other non sequitur is about... Five seconds. Trusting what I say about Joseph Smith. I'm not asking anybody to trust what I say about Joseph Smith or about anything else. I deal in facts. You deal in baseless accusations. And that segment is wrapped up beautifully. Two segments left. Woo! How we doing? Everyone all right? Yep. All right. Here we go for the next segment. Mormon issues facing the church today. It's kind of been talked about. 
We'll bring it up again, Quaker. You already talked about it, mentioned it, but the issue of homosexual relationships has been hotly bandied about in LES Church for a few decades, post Prop 8 in California. A few years back, there seems to be greater acceptance of uh, homosexuals in the church today than, say, going back 30 years. There seems to be. Uh, what would be your individual reactions if the brethren um, in the next general conference, hypothetically, um, ordained as an apostle, not a homosexual man, but a lesbian. Um, would you question that? Would you uh, find that offensive? Would you think that the church was being progressive or would you think that they were being digressive? Please use this obviously hyperbolic scenario to speak about the homosexual issue in the church relative to worthiness, priesthood ordination, and temple marriages. Uh, can we, would it be all right if we used LGBT instead of- Anything you want, I don't right? care. Okay, I just wanna, okay. You um, say whatever you want. So, uh, real quick, I grew up in Houston, Texas. I, I spent a while in, in San Francisco. Um, I didn't grow up in a culture that was anti-LGBT. It's never really been a part of, of that, just any sort of bigoted attitudes, just not been a part of how I was raised. So I do admit when, I come to, when you come to Utah, you find some attitudes that are not acceptable. Um, all I can really say is I believe heaven is going to be very crowded. And Joseph Smith said the same sociality that exists on earth will exist in heaven. And if our sexual attraction and our romantic attraction is the same here as it is there, who is to tell me that there won't be, in, in kingdoms of heaven, there won't be gay people? I, I, don't, I don't see how there wouldn't be. So I'm, I'm of the belief that heaven will be crowded, that there'll be all kinds of people there. And if at the next general conference, you know, uh, the brethren sustained um, a lesbian woman to be an apostle, that, I mean, that's like f female priesthood, and then it's like five jumping. Kate Kelly and her wife. Yes, Kate Kelly and her wife. Thank um, you. You know, I would say, I, I, I'm gonna take a step back. I'm gonna look at what's going on. I'm gonna pray about it. But ultimately, I'm not going to reject and leave the people that I'm a part of. I'm not just going to walk away and say, oh my goodness, how dare they let those lesbians into our church. I'm not gonna take that attitude. It's incredibly different. But I think as human beings, we, we are allowed to have the charity to take things in, to look at it, and make, make your own opinion. And my opinion might be different than a number of people in the audience, and that's okay. But again, this is a very hyperbolic question. Yeah. It's like, what would you do tomorrow if you had wings and no feet? Like, right, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, right. it, it could be anything. Yeah. How much time do we have? Oh, you've got quite a bit. You've got... Okay. Um, well, basically, we're, we're, we're addressing the LGBG, LGBTQIA question. And um, once again, it's so hard for people to disassociate the cultural expectations and the arguments of the society at large with the religious arguments, okay? And I think it goes both ways, on both sides of the argument. Both people are at fault here, okay? Um, I think just as the Apostle Peter saw the great sheet come down in which he was told for the first time that you should go out and you should preach to the Greeks, you should preach to the Gentiles, and there is nothing that is unclean to eat. That was a drastic change for people that were used to perceiving themselves as a sect of Judaism. So drastic that it caused problems in the early church, less than 100 years after Jesus Christ died, right? I think that if the prophet were to come out and say, wow, we're, I've received a revelation from the Lord that we're going to include lesbian, uh, not pastors, but you know, um, uh, church leaders and, and, and gay bishops or whatever you wanna, um, how do you wanna give, I think there would be a lot of people that struggled with, with that, just as members of the early church struggle with the idea of letting those Greeks into our Jewish faith, okay? At the same token, I survived Proposition 8 in California. I have scrubbed the graffiti off old women's cars the broken garage doors, broken windows, bruised businesses, broken families, because the secular argument of this decided to go down the list of every donor, any person that had a Proposition 8 uh, a sticker on their, um, on their car, 
and brutalize these people, whether it's through horrible, heinous Yelp reviews of their businesses online, boycotting their restaurants so they can't go inside, uh, publishing donor lists and doxing these people so they then have bigot in orange paint uh, sprayed on their, their, their teal Toyota Camry, I'll never forget that one. There is nobody in this argument that is bloodless. And I would suggest that the secular arguments that are telling people that your bishops don't uh, won't like you, that if you come out, you will be hated, that seeds doubt in these young people's minds who are already in vulnerable times of their life trying to, to figure out their sexuality. No one is bloodless in this argument. So I have a faith that teaches, regardless of your orientation, your skin color, you are a child of God. You have an unconditional value that he will leave the 99, dang it, I'm sorry, he will leave the 99 to go find that one. That's my faith, it always has been. So you talk about straw men's and character assassination, the worst character assassination I see in the church with modern issues right now is the modern secularist trying to say that anybody who is a Christian like Shaw McCraney or a member of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ like we are somehow hate our brothers and sisters for something that is, that is for lack of a better term, they all say they didn't choose it. So that is the biggest problem I see with the argument right now. And how much we got? One minute. One minute. I just want to say that I, I agree with what these guys have said. If they ordained a lesbian to be in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, I would go home, pray about it, talk to God about it. That's what I've always been taught by the church to do. We are supposed to work these things out with our Father in Heaven. And like Cardin gave that good example, we're supposed to figure these things out and they will be difficult sometimes. We'll have to recognize that what we know and what we think we know are not always correct. I think the search for truth is incredibly difficult and that as we continue searching for truth, we would all be better off if we did a better job of loving God and loving our neighbor and focusing on those two things as we go. Still the last five seconds. This side of the stage believes that gay people will exist eternally and that they have divine worth, and that side doesn't. Okay, it's your turn. You have eight minutes to respond to that. It's all yours. I thought it was the Mormon church you were representing. No, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, right. No. The ones, hey, we got one, too. The ones that doesn't allow gay people to get married in the temple or to be actively gay and be a member in good standing. This is what I'm talking about. They create a Mormon church that has nothing to do with the real church, and then they defend it and act like they've accomplished something. It's like a reverse straw man, okay? <laughs> That's what they've been doing all night. Now, an apostle lesbian. Interesting idea. By the way, you talked about the development of doctrine. Charlie Harrell, professor at BYU, maybe retired now, wrote a great book called This Is My Doctrine. He showed that there is not one doctrine in the Church of Jesus Christ of Mormon church that has not changed since its inception. They have all changed. Everything's changed. Homosexuality has changed. Bill Real and I did a show a few weeks ago on Mormonism Live, Wednesdays at 620 Mountain Standard. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and we talked about that. No, just 40 years ago, 30 years ago, simply being homosexual was a sin in the LDS church. And Spencer Kimball and other church leaders, as prophet, by the way, taught that. Now they've come to the point where, okay, mm, science is catching up, we've got to modify, feed her to the fire. Okay, being homosexual is not a sin, but acting homosexual is, all right? You can be homosexual and be a member of the church as long as you can sign yourself to a lifetime of loneliness and being marginalized. And it's wonderful how the church says, oh, yeah, gay people are welcome. Yeah, they're welcome as long as you don't have any human relationships or intimacy in your entire life. By the way, you asked who it was who's saying that being gay, you can't get into heaven. That would be Elder Holland. You may have been concentrating so much on his musket remark just this last August that you missed the primary message, which is, we have gone as far as we can in extending rights within the church and within the doctrine of the church to gay people, which means, no, you cannot be actively gay and be a member in good standing, just like now. You cannot be gay and be married in the temple. 
They've gone about as far as they can go. Oklahoma, right? They've gone about as far as they can go, and they're not going to go any further. So that's who it is who said it, if you want to go and look it up. Uh, do, did I have eight minutes or just three? Yeah, you have eight. Oh, yeah. wow. I can talk about another thing. Okay. The other thing is this. The reason that the modern-day apostles and the leaders of the church cannot find any way past this homosexual issue is because the entire plan of salvation slash, slash exaltation in the LDS church is based upon the heterosexual sex act. That's why. That's the problem they have. Because even though really Joseph Smith didn't teach this, there may have been implications in some of the things he taught. Brigham Young's the one who picked it up and took that football down the, uh, the gridiron. When you get to heaven, you have to have a wife. More wives are better because then you can be having eternal celestial sex with them because there are planets to populate and they are not going to populate themselves. So exalted beings have to be really busy forever. And as attractive as that might sound to the men in the audience, my understanding is that women have a little bit of a different view of it. And this is the problem. I did a whole show on this, trying to explain, and I hope that the, uh, what was it, the um, SCMC, the um, Strengthening Church Members Committee, which monitors me, <laughs> would take my message and pass it along to the top 15, which is that Brigham Young got it wrong. You're starting from a false premise. Joseph Smith never taught that exaltation is about eternally having sex. Uh, maybe mortality was in his point of view, I'm not sure. <laughs> but eternal <laughs> exaltation was not because spirits were not in his theology created through sexual intercourse by divine beings. Spirits have always existed. There is no creation about them. It's in Abraham chapter 3. It's in the King Follett discourse. That's the thing. God could not create himself. Do you remember that saying? God could not create himself, and he could not create any of the spirits because the spirits have always existed. And God, finding himself in the midst of spirits, saw fit that he should create a way that they could advance to become like him. And if the leaders of the church today, I give this to you for free. You don't have to give me any credit if you would get away from Brigham Young's teaching in this regard and go back to the prophet of the restoration, he has already given you the answer as to how gay people, homosexuals and lesbians, can be accepted in full fellowship in this church and receive all the temple ordinances necessary to exaltation. Thank you. You have three minutes to wrap it up. RFM, you don't believe in exaltation. Why do you always tell me what I believe and what I don't? Because I'm going by what you've said. I've watched your show. I know what you believe. You've said it. And don't interrupt me. You don't believe in exaltation. You don't believe that gay people will even exist eternally. You teach, and your audience and your side in large teaches that when you die, that's it. So someone saying, by the way, um, LGBT people, stay away from the LDS church because if you join it or if you're raised in it, they're going to bully you, they're going to treat you terribly, and you're not allowed to find love. Um, instead, come over here where when you die, that's it. You don't have eternal worth. You don't have divine worth. And you're just a clump of cells. I cannot think of a more horrible thing to tell an LGBT person than what ultimately your narrative suggests they are. We suggest they're children of God with eternal worth and you suggest they're nothing but a, a, a piece of meat. Can, can, can we just ask a question? Because I think I can get into a, lori a laborious explanation <laughs> describing why with the concept of eternal progress we concentrate so much on the fact that gender is eternal, all, all this other stuff. But I think there is point, a point to delineating the fact that if you don't believe in a God, you all of a sudden have to accept far more brutal and far more um, destructive ideas 
than any straw man arguments made about Mormon culture, which I'm willing to accept may have some elements that do need to get worked out in some areas. Um, so I would want to hear you speak, not have Quaker or me or you put words in your mouth. Do you believe there's a God and we exist after this life when we die? So you're going to forfeit in a minute of your time. Yeah. Oh, wait, what's that? I think no, no, I, I just I, want to know yeah. because Quite it agree, changes Quite the agree. nature of our arguments. Okay. Yeah, it, it completely changes the, the nature arguments. of our arguments. I, Do you believe there's a God and we continue after we die? And well, hold just on. Before, I want, I want, before he gets into that, I just lament that you think eternal families can be reduced to just the heterosexual act. I, no, I I'm, think that's a mischaracterization of everything we say, and I think that that's yeah, no, I, I remarkably get irresponsible that. To, to treat it that way. You've done this a bunch of times tonight, attacking our beliefs, attacking our temple ceremonies, and saying the rudest things. Okay, let's let him... But I'll let you, I'll let you go. Let, let's let him answer. Do you believe break the rules? Go ahead and have a little shot. Do you believe this. there's a God and we continue after this life? Okay, and I will answer your question, and I will pose one to you, which is why is the American flag on your bulletproof vest backward? Well, what's interesting is only the U.S. military is allowed to fly the um, flag with the forward cant, I believe they call it, because that's the cant that it holds when you're flying it into battle. All the other flags, like in the Boy Scouts of America, have to have the camp facing backwards because it's a non-battle stance. So out of respect for the armed forces, if I'm not serving in the armed forces, I have it faced this way. Okay. I would think that after tonight's episode, <laughs> you'd have it upside down. That's the international distress signal you're doing there, Kwaku. <laughs> We well, take the answer to your question. Him. He oh, was just Canada. he was just taking it off and putting it upside down. <laughs> okay. Yeah. International distress signal. Okay, so here's the deal. I don't know. Like Kurt, like Kurt Russell says in Big Trouble in Little China, I'm an ordinary guy, but I've just experienced some extraordinary things. I've experienced some extraordinary things in my life, including my testimony of the Book of Mormon. It took me a long time to get myself off that, that fly paper where the church told me that that means that the leaders of the church are it and realize that it's something that's more inside me than it is inside them. But I have had experiences that I cannot deny. I do believe that there are things that happen, things that exist that are outside of the usual five senses. I think that they are both good and bad, and I've experienced both of them. And I think that every now and then, for reasons I have no idea about, that they can break through and contact some of us, maybe all of us, so I think there are people who've never had that. Some of us are more prone to it than others. Me, Pisces, definitely. So my answer is I don't know, but I believe that there are things that we don't comprehend normally with so, our normal so senses. Why, why can't we give that charity? Why can't we give that charity to the, ec to the exploration of our history, to working out all of these spiritual problems? I agree with you and say, okay, maybe there's too much char char character assassination in, in the web about how we address each other. And fine, if you're willing to say a stylistically <laughs> violent um, Quentin Tarantino meme that is very popular among Gen Zers, a swashbuckling Peter Pan meme that is very famous amongst Zoomers, and a Muhammad Ali knockout scene, which is very famous amongst uh, really young kids, may not have been to your taste. I will be willing to say that maybe we were joking when you said, oh, you say there's something wrong with it. But you can't say that we're the only people doing something wrong and not taking a joke if you can't take the joke yourself. And you can't say, oh, I don't know is a fair get out of jail free card when you lambast the Mormon faith for simply saying, we don't know, but we have these commitments to certain basic doctrines that we know are right. You have to give this charity to others if you're demanding it yourself. I will say that number one, I have never thought that uh, a video that depicts even in mean form the violent and brutal bashing in the head of another human being is a joke. Number two, you say that you're talking about, well, you know, we don't know. But Mormonism is built on, I know. Well, some things. 
every single first Sunday of every month is fast and testimony meeting, unless they've changed that recently. And every single person gets up there and says, I know this. I know Joseph Smith was a prophet. I know the Book of Mormon is true. I know the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only true and living church upon the face of the earth. And I know that Russell M. Nelson is the only true heart surgeon. <laughs> right? It is based upon I know. And I think, with all respect, I think this is once again you creating a different church than we, we all know the Mormon church is and saying it's not based on I know. I give you respect for your beliefs, absolutely. Even if you say I know, that's fine. I said that forever. I said that on my mission to Japan. I said it in fast and testimony meetings. I said it when I was teaching the gospel to my friends. I bore my testimony, so I know how that is. What I found out through experience was is that I didn't really know anything. I was saying the words in order to sound like I was sure of something that I really wasn't that sure of. Um, I'd like to explore, I'm, I don't know if this breaks I'm just letting this go because you guys are being Ex civil. Explore. <laughs> if, I, if I can, pardon, pardon. Uh, if we could dissect what the word no means, because I think we can find commonality here. When you do the deep dive into, I know the church is true, I know the Book of Mormon is true, well, what does no mean? Because it falls down the synonym rabbit hole of strong belief. What does that strong belief mean? What does to believe mean? To accept? I accept the message that the church is a self-declared truth. Like, so we have to get into almost the philosophy of what does no actually mean? Does it mean knowledge? I have knowledge of this church and I believe it. We have to dissect these things. I mean, the Greeks were genius for having a million different words for, for one thing like love. So. It is, a, it is a little bit of a language barrier because when some, one person says, I know the church is true, he means, I strongly believe the church is true. When another person says, I know the church is true, they mean, I hope the church is true. This word is something that can be applied to many different people and it means many different things. And so I want to know, genuinely asking, when you said, I know the church is true, what did you mean by that? Uh, Sean, I'll yes. be happy to answer this, but I think this is getting into really boring stuff. Well, I no, mean, I, they, they, I, I'm just saying, I think it is. <laughs> I don't think this is going to be widely, widely appreciated. Okay, I, let's finish this segment up. You answer that, and then we're going to get to the final questions, and we'll, okay? Okay, we're I hear what done. you're saying. I but know you have another event to go to, don't you? Oh, no, no, no. I'm not oh, trying to get out of well, here quick. Okay. I'm sorry. Because okay. you've been saying, you, can't, you say it's all based on I know, I know, I know. Well, it is. So what does no mean? Because that seems like a logical next question well, to you, ask. You Here's the thing. a very hey, specific wait. criticism of Here's the thing. So he's oh, I was going to ask. Okay. So, Kwaku, if you were correct then it would be okay and no eyebrows would be raised in a fast and testimony meeting for a member to get up there and say, I don't know the church is true, but I hope it's true. I've heard that a million times. I have never heard it once. You haven't been in a while then. I have I've never heard it, heard it once. I, it, can, hey, can the Gen Zers admit you hear this? I've said that. It happens all the time. Okay, 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 all that, don't lose it. It's, I, I don't know what to say. It's, all right. I, I just think the one thing that I want to say is you've accused us of making a church that doesn't exist yes. in order to defend it. Yes. I think you're doing the same thing to attack it. It is much easier for you to make up a church that is everything you say it is, and that's not the case. It's much more complex in its history than what you have. You highlight the things that support what you have to say. And like you have talked about just now, you said that Joseph Smith never looked at the gold plates. The records are there that say that he did. It's more complex than the way you present it. Where? There, there is no record that says he looked at the gold plates when there he are. translated the Book of Mormon. There are records that say it. Show go it to me all. and I will put it on my okay, show. We can go and look at them. It's not that he did that the entire time. It's that he did that at the beginning. This is something that is difficult. History in and of itself is a difficult thing for us to try to understand. And I get it. I don't think you're necessarily being malicious with this. I think that it's something that we just are wrestling with, learning how we present the things we learn. And can I say the reason we have to wrestle with it is because the church has done such a good job of hiding it for over 100 years. Then why do we have all of the records there now? Wait, wait, but it's on. not because just the, the internet. Because of the internet, that's they exactly why. They existed before then, on. and okay, we had right, access. Okay. No, was, they didn't. I, you've got dad joke game, brother. It's better than dad jokes. I'm genuinely yeah. funny. You're genuinely funny, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like... And 
I may be the only guy on this stage old enough to get half of these jokes, and they're good. Like, I can testify to you. <laughs> okay. But do you know? That his, and I know with a surety that his three men and a baby joke and his Oklahoma reference was solid, okay? <laughs> However, this is what I really worry about. I, I have this phrase, and I, I'm seeing it tonight so much. Oftentimes, modern anti-Mormonism doesn't refute scripture, it fulfills it. And my fear is the scripture that says, in the latter days, men's hearts will fail them. This massive cynicism that has overcome our society, not just Mormonism, this is a microcosm that is representative of a massive macrocosm in the West. And if you want to look at the history of your faith through that cynical of a lens to interpret Joseph Smith or the Book of Mormon or any of these historical elements, the way you guys are doing, why aren't you going to the the embassy, the United States embassy, when you figure out that the wounded knee battle that we gave all those purple hearts for wasn't actually a battle, but a massacre of innocent Indians was probably started by a mentally ill child. And that the guys that actually got the purple heart for being wounded in battle were shot most likely by friendly fire. When we find about, out about the, the massive overbombing of Western Germany, when we find out about these horrible civil rights violations that we have been engaged in as a country, you don't go to the embassy and forfeit your citizenship and then start an angry blog about how bad America is. When we find out that Thomas Jefferson probably had non-consensual okay. relationships with a slave, up. And, and there's children it's that good, exist today from that. that man. It's we don't to go forfeit off. our citizenship. So, like, I worry that if we engage in this level of citizen, we will destroy ourselves. Can I tell you why I don't in one sentence? Yeah, sure. No, take your time. Like, because I'll give you I half believe that the United States of America is the greatest country that has ever existed in the history of the world. Yeah, baby! Woo! <laughs> awesome. I that's I'm, why. I'm just excited that that's the biggest reaction we've gotten tonight. <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. If I had a t-shirt, I'd give it to you. All right, listen, we need to, I'm gonna let you guys vote because you guys gave me the format and then you all broke it. All right, so here it is. <laughs> Sorry. All right, here it is. I have three questions uh, left. I've given you the harder questions at the opening. Uh, the, the last questions are a little bit tougher on you. Okay. Do you want to do them? I do. No, I still want to answer to no. What does no mean to you? I still want to hear the answer. Well, we can do that after. We can discuss do it that after. later. You, All right. We'll do an episode later. I think they want to hear it. I think someone want to hear it. It's All right. So we're going back, and this is RFM questions to RFM. Yes, sir. All right. Um, and I am exacting my ransom for doing this. Um, what do you mean? I, I'm, I'm going to personally bring myself into this question with you. Oh, OK. Uh, oh. Years of uh, ripping Mormonism apart. Um, with some of the same stuff you've done, mm -hmm. maybe a little more vitriol, mm -hmm. uh, I discovered that uh, we're bringing people out, bringing people out in droves, and uh, leaving them to some unfortunate devices. And I've seen it firsthand. The reason people leave Mormonism is almost uh, more important than the fact that they leave it. If you can give them enough stuff to convince them and they walk, you could be giving them a, a death sentence because I've seen it and I saw that as an error of my own. That, and I don't mean just atheism. I mean nihilism. I mean literally going down a rabbit hole of self-destruction because the church did give them the we've got it, we're true, and the information I gave them was it's not. And they saw it, they heard it, they read it, and they said, I'm going. I want to know how you balance that. What are you and Bill doing to balance the idea that while you don't agree with Mormonism based on the facts, RFM, my brother, what are you giving people to, to, to sustain them if they say, okay, I agree with that? Because it is scorched fucking earth. And people are ruined when we pull them out. I've seen it. Yes. So what are you doing in your ministry? And you've also seen the people who are ruined within the Mormon church. Of course. Who commit suicide on the steps of a stake center because they can find no place within the Mormon church for being gay, except to be told that they are not accepted by God and they are never good enough. And they pray That's and they pray. That's not church doctrine. Wait, let him talk. It's let an actual talk. thing that happened. 
history. And they pray and they pray and they pray that God will change them to make them the way that they know God wants them to be. And God doesn't change them and God doesn't change them. And so finally, they become completely distressed and they end it. And that happens. So it happens within the church, it happens outside the church. Right. Can I just push back and, and sure. lightly reject your push premise? Push back. My, my pushback on you is the, is the idea, which I think is implicit in your question, that in order for me to criticize Mormonism, that I have to create some kind of alternative that's better. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that as my responsibility. I will say, though, that I have never, and still don't, and don't anticipate ever, having it as a goal to try and get people out of the LDS church. And I've said that a number of times. Uh, I remember the first time I was being interviewed by John DeLynn, and he kept not believing me. And he said, no, you really do. I said, no, I don't. Because I was in Mormonism, and Mormonism worked fabulously for me for the first 10 years. But when I was ready to graduate, there was no Master Poe at the gates of the Shaolin Temple saying, snatch the pebble from my hand. <laughs> Mormonism, once it gets its hooks into you, it will keep you forever running on the same hamster wheel and going nowhere. But you think you are, but you're not really. Mormonism is like a bus stop where you're waiting for a bus that never comes. That was my experience. And I kept trying and trying and trying and realizing after time, there is no meat. There is no there, there. What satisfied me and was good for me in my first stage of life was completely inadequate in my second stage of life. And there are people out there, I would say the majority of people who learn about the historical issues of the church, the majority probably do become disaffiliated with the LDS church. But there are exceptions to that. There are very intelligent people who know all the issues and know them even better than I do, who remain faithful in the LDS church, and God bless them. One of the great, great joys of graduating from Mormonism to me was no longer feeling that I had the obligation to convert other people to my beliefs. Now I simply investigate, I share. If you take whatever it is that I, I say and you think that's good, great. If you don't, that's fine too because I'm not here to convert anybody. And that's great. The other great thing about not being faithful, active, Mormon anymore is on the last day of the month, I don't have to feel guilty about not doing my home teaching. Uh, well, I, I, I have a follow-up. It's not your time yet. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. All right. And my follow-up is that, so what I hear you saying is your job is to present the negatives of the LDS church uh, as, as far as you see them, but it's not your job to have any responsibility whatsoever right. with the outcome of what happens with people once they see those things or embrace them as true. That's true. Okay. No okay. responsibility. I will say, however, that... I also investigate all sorts of aspects. I mean, I'm the person who discovered the Holy Grail for Book of Mormon apologetics, which is the presence in the Book of Mormon of ancient Hebrew numerology. Mm -hmm. It is the most significant, in my humble opinion, it is the most significant evidence for the ancientness of the Book of Mormon, and I discovered it. And I talked about it on one of the podcasts. I talk about the positive as well as the negative. Probably more negative than positive, granted. But I want to give Joseph Smith, I've already done it tonight, giving Joseph Smith credit for coming up initially, even though he wasn't talking about homosexuality, mm -hmm. paving the way for gay people to be fully accepted in the LDS church in his teachings, even in his King Fala discourse. Okay. And I have, he still has time. I have a follow-up for you, and that is this. And I prepared this, th knowing these guys and knowing you. Do you see the value in what they do? toward change within Mormonism. I mean, what these guys are representing is definitely not what you and I got. And what they are suggesting will, could go a long way in changing those old guys up on North Temple. Yes, and I hope it will. I hope it will. All right. I will, I will say, however, that what they're presenting, even though um, it's laced with all sorts of um, libelous material and incendiary and false claims, it's which make it difficult. 
Slander. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so he admits it's slander. Thank you, pardon. Pardon? It's, it's almost joke. done. I know from Kay Kelly. Yeah, it's an old one. Anyway, anyway, uh, what I was going to say is the problem is, is that what they represent, even the good aspects, were enough to get them cut off of FAIR and their videos taken down because the establishment of the church represented by FAIR could not brook the negative comments they were getting about them from more established faithful members of the church. Okay, can I respond? Now it's, no wait, he's, uh, are you done? He's done? Okay, now you have your eight minutes, Cardin. Okay, um, <laughs> damn. I, I worry about this. Let me just get the FAIR thing out of the way right away. Uh, FAIR has a phrase that everything here operates at the speed of volunteer. They've gone through a rebrand. They've also changed their board of directors. And unfortunately, because lots of it runs on email, I'm friends with them and I'm getting the rights to our original This Is The Show back and gonna be doing some small edits and so on and so forth. But it wasn't chopped off, it wasn't taken off. This is a, this is a narrative that formed in anti-Mormon circles that perpetuates to this day. And it's part of the reason why I'm so dubious of a lot of these historical analyses of our history, because as the director of the This Is The Show, I can tell you what he just said is not true. And I lived it. This is my lived experience. And so the videos are still up at Fair Mormon. Well, hold on. No, 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 no. Because when we posted those without going down a stupid rabbit hole, because I realized we're under time, we were under a lot of pressure trying to figure out where we were going to put them. My channel had not been formed yet. They realized it wasn't content that's usually for 65 year olds, which is like the average age of the people that watch their YouTube channel. If you look on analytics. So we decided in the reband that we were going to take down a bunch of videos. This is the show was not the only one that was taken down, but because it was the most incendiary online, all of these narratives developed. So as a person that's lived it, I can tell you this straw man that he put up, this narrative from 2019 is not true. And it's not the first time this happened. And I would say actually RFM, this is a problem that I have that I think is demonstrative of the ex Mormon versus Mormon argument right now is you literally just made a Cain and Abel argument saying when I tear people away from their faith and I introduce doubt and I introduce cynicism and vitriol, I'm not responsible. Cain literally said, am I my brother's keeper? We believe we are our brother's keeper. I, I'm not here to say gay people are condemned. I'm condemned. I, I read the scriptures and I don't think I identify with the saints with Peter, with Jesus. No, I identify with the man who's praying in the central square saying, God, forgive me for I know I am a sinner. I identify with the man who took his child to Jesus and, and said, will you heal him? And Jesus says, do you believe? And he's like, helpest thou me mine unbelief. I believe that my participation in Midnight Mormons in the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints is, is being part of my family, both nuclear and my human family at large, my gay brothers and sisters, I love you. I always have. The internet didn't make me do it. Jesus Christ's perfect example made me do it. So this straw man that we, we hate, these members of our church, no, we love them. And I don't even know where to start when you say these kinds of things, because over here you're tearing down faith saying, I'm not responsible. And here I'm saying, whatever faith you have just come and I want to be responsible for you. I want to be a part of your life. I will be your keeper like the pioneers walked with those who had broken legs. Tell me your problems and I will walk with you. That's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in my mind. I yield my time. I think it's also interesting that really the first time RFM answered a question tonight is when you had to push him to answer the question. You've danced around almost everything presented. The reality is if you are taking, destroying people's faith, bringing in negativity and cynicism, and then leaving them to rot on the ground, I mean, that, that sounds just like thus we see that the devil will not support his children at the last day. Again, you're fulfilling the scripture that you claim to be false. And I want to believe that this isn't, this isn't something malicious. It's just a nature, oh, you're, you're an attorney. This is just how it is. You can't treat human beings like that. You're treating them as literal objects. Objects just as ears to listen to your rants. And then when their faith is destroyed, you say, it's not my fault. 
oh, if you get divorced, not my fault. If your kids don't like you, not my fault. If you kill yourself, not my fault. Hey, if you kill yourself, it's not my fault. But look, some of the Mormon gays killed themselves. Just, just look at that. Don't pay attention to what I'm doing. This is not how responsible people with media, uh, uh, I'll use it for his empires, act. Empires in, in the Mormon circle, right? <laughs> right? It's not moral. It is immoral. No, they just tweet out memes of people getting their heads ba and bashed in with baseball. You're going to have your chance. You're going to have your chance. We, you get your final say. Okay. And, and, <laughs> no, you retweeted it. You've got three minutes. I, you will I, have three minutes. You go stuck ahead. a lesbian yeah. porn star into the temple. So Let whatever. them go. I, I do think that there is a little bit of over generalization that happens sometimes. Because when you talk about the things like, you guys retweeted this meme. I didn't. I did not retweet that. Right? And so I think maybe if we all take a second and look at each other a little bit more clearly, and we, I know we see through a glass darkly, we can maybe say, RFM is not necessarily doing these horrible things all the time, and we are not as horrible as you think we are. Well, and also, let's take some kind of scoreboard here. Okay, an errant meme made by some 17-year-old behind a laptop in Lehigh, Utah, is far different than stripping people of their faith, destroying families, and then leaving them in an nihilistic dustbin and just to figure it out for himself. And, and the last thing I want to say about that RFM is, look, you Why do we treat call it. Him RFM? I, because he's asked to be called that way. I will respect Have you? that. Yes, he. Oh, okay, yeah. Sorry. Or, well, at least in my estimation, I thought you had. So okay. I think that when you treat the church as as unkindly as you do and you flippantly throw it off and speak about how you graduated from Mormonism, you're implicitly telling your entire audience that they are dumber for staying in. You are giving them this little bit of, a, of an idea that, oh man, if I really want to be smart, I should leave the church too. You are doing that implicitly in what you're doing. I don't know if that's your goal or if it's just a consequence of the way that you've started talking about this, but I think it's important that we all do a better job of viewing what it is that we say and how we say it and try to actually help people come to know God and do something positive with it, not just leave them there. Because I think this criticism is very valid that you're leaving them without anywhere to go. Well, and also my last thing is, I'm not even expecting you to be on the sensitivity train. Sometimes I'm not there and that's one of my flaws, okay? But I just want us to be consistent. If you want to be able to say stuff like, oh, I graduated beyond Mormonism, Russell M. Nelson is just a heart surgeon, Joseph Smith was an X, Y, or Z heinous thing, then you should be able to take it. But it seems like you're not. You'll call any joke we make character assassination and then impugn us and our church and our faith and anybody else's uh, views on that with impunity. So I either want you to just either take the jokes and we can laugh together and rib each other or else become just as sensitive as Brad here and stop saying things like, oh, well, when I graduated, because they're all stupid, you know what I'm saying? Like, you have to choose which you want to do. We just want consistency. 15 seconds. And, I mean, these guys are nicer than me. I'm not going to lie. I, I don't think you actually have positive intent. And I think your lack of care for humanity and the divinity of souls has, is, it's evident on your podcast. And if you Google Corbin Valuse, Stephen Anthony Richards, you defended a teenager who chopped up his sister and put her in a freezer and tried to get those records hidden from the public. Okay. I mean, I don't think you actually have a care and love for human beings. You have three minutes to defend you're yourself. An attorney, that. Three minutes. Let him have Look it. it up. Google it. Look it up. This is the three minute final. Oh, I'm not defending myself here. By the way, for purposes of this debate, there is no Corbin. There is only Zool. <laughs> wait, wait, that's the original Ghostbusters, right? Yes. Yes, I got that one too. Rock on, okay, dude. One We're, modern movie. I, I bought that movie. laser <laughs> disc with an eBay 1991 <laughs> laser disc player. We got to bring give it back. Give him time, give him Go. Time. I still refuse to accept your moral equivalency of retweeting violent memes about people that we know getting their heads bashed in with baseball bats with me saying I have graduated from Mormonism. We didn't say that. That is a false equivalency. I refuse to accept it. That's really about all I have to say about that particular thing. But there's like, what, two more minutes left? Yeah, there's two. Okay. Then can I clarify? No, he, well, he's, it's oh, a, no. if he's, it's if he's summary. If he's no, done. and I want to ask Brad a question. Brad, what are you doing hanging out with these two? I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> because. <laughs> because, <laughs> because you should be over here with me, I think. But I will tell you, the problem right now is that 
you are going to be tarred with the same brush as these two, and it will not be good for you any more than it already is. I know you come across as a sweet guy. You kind of like look like Shermie the Elf from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> I you don't know? know if I should be insulted <laughs> or not. He's I am not just guy. a misfit. So, but you're hanging out with them. Look, I'll tell you make your own decisions, okay? I'm just saying it's not good for you, okay? Because these two engage in malicious, um, libelous, baseless accusations against other people who are alive and have wives and have children and who themselves are human beings. And then you get up here, and actually you do too, and talk about how I treat people like garbage because I don't know if there's a God and I don't know if life continues after this. That strikes me as the height of irony. So you think a violent meme is, 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 That's all I have is to very say. bad? That's all, it's just time for you. Okay. We have, did you, did we have, do you want him to answer? Or? I'm what done. About no, no, no. It's, it's three. We went eight, eight, three. All right. Okay. We have one question left each. We're going to do four minutes instead of eight. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, but I would, at this juncture, mm -hmm. like to ask, can we, at this point, agree at least to stop the... Whatever is happening with the videos and the accusations between you. He defended a guy who chopped up his sister and put her in a freezer. Hey, that's a, hey, 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 it's a real on. thing. That's, that's, that's a real his thing. job. That's his job. He's Not, a defender. So listen, can we agree? She doesn't. Can we agree to stop the, the videos that show a bashing of somebody and the this? 100 percent. I'll tell you right now, the reason why I'm able to make that full throated on camera. Yeah saying that I will not level an accusation that is not backed up by a provable fact. I won't do any of that stuff. And I'll, I'll do my very ginger best to keep it above the belt. I'm willing to do that because I have such faith that their side won't last a week. I'll do that. Well, let's all wait and see. Well, I, we haven't got an agreement. I've been on the air for five years. Can we agree that we will be kinder to each other in the things that we're posting ad hominem about each other's ways and lives and approaches? We That's also, all I'm asking. I have not engaged in that. At all? No. I, I would invite you to look at your Facebook page for the last week. I'm Corbin, the one who's been you literally it. mocked Brad for not returning a Facebook message saying, where is he at? He's scared. When he was in the hospital with an 11 month old newborn with a kidney 11 infection. 11 day old. 11 day old newborn. You had no idea where he was. Yet you're calling him everything from a chicken to a okay, coward so to a this, this is to why that. I'm not a chicken or a coward. And you lie about the things I say in order to put me on the same level as you. So what you're saying then, just let me get it straight is you won't stop. He's not going to stop. Personal it's part of his chemistry. He <laughs> said he's not going to stop. He said, I will stop as long as it's not based by fact. And by that, he means innuendo well, well, and the conclusions well, well, no, he no, reaches he, he, based on okay. zero evidence. All right, I just want no, to try. This is a, no, this is a great yeah, question. No, and I well, hold on. This is a great question. I want the audience to understand this so they understand what I view as the ethics of apologetics. Ad hominem attacks, generally taboo. We need then to why do you do them all the time? Even tonight. Okay, let me finish. We need to understand what they are, though. Generally, if you decide to attack the person instead of the argument or the substance of that argument, it's what's called a false argument, okay? It's, it's a dodge. Unless you are calling into question the person's credibility or a conflict of interest. The Wikipedia page article has the definition on your phones when you leave. So the only time I am ever calling into question somebody's personal life is if I'm calling into question a conflict of interest or credibility. Like me I representing believe, a kid on. who committed I believe, murder? I, I, How I is disagree. that one of those? I disagree I, with Craig on that. That's hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Well, hold on. Let me finish. So I you're disagree. Saying, you're, so you're saying that I Quaker disagree did with Quaker. engage in ad hominem I, we're allowed right to disagree. That's Let me work. finish. Okay. I disagree with Quaker bringing that up. Benjamin Franklin defended the people that were in the Boston Massacre, so I believe every person, no matter That's how That's John is, Adams. Go ahead. Okay, exactly. So, <laughs> I, I will call into question financial gains based off of destroying people's faith. 
I will call into question people who want to impugn historical leaders of our church for sexual, what they perceive as sexual indiscretions, when they are engaged in plentiful sexual indiscretions themselves okay, that so, are provable. All right, so that's just, the definition okay, of that hominid. Can, 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 I, can I answer? Yeah. That was the topic. I, I think, I really appreciate the question first off. Can we agree to stop this? Because I think we should. I think we should do our best to rise above it. I think that... I, I, thank you. I, I think that really what we should be doing is looking for truth where we can find it. I have trouble because of the attitude that we've just talked about that you asked in this question just before, that I am not my brother's keeper. I'm just gonna tell you horrible things about the church and now it's gone, right? I, I think it's difficult because we're engaging with people who say things about church leaders that are sometimes unsubstantiated, right? We're s dealing with people who are making bad faith arguments a lot of the time. And so I think that it's easy for us to engage in the same sort of thing. I personally am committed to trying to make that better. In fact, it's part of the answer to your question, why am I here with Kwaku and Cardin? Because I want to try to be a bit of a good influence if I can be. Right? <laughs> I want to see what I can do That's to good. help get us in the right track because they're on the right track at least a little bit. Brad, it's not working. Yet. <laughs> All right. Give it time. Give it time. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Let's, let's proceed. Jeez, thanks, Four minutes Brad. left of each. <laughs> You're doing great. It's them Brutal. first. You ready? This is the last one. It's not easy. In the first vision, truth, uh, Joseph, uh, in the first vision, Joseph Smith was plainly told that Christianity had fallen off the path most pleasing to God and that he should join none of the denominations. He was told, according to the 1838-39 account, that the main villain of Christianity was their creeds, but also the uh, heart of the professors of the faith. Also the heart of the professors of the faith, not just the creeds. In response to this question, which of all sects was right, Joseph Smith said, I was answered that I must join none of them, the churches, for they are all wrong. All their creeds are an abomination in his sight that those professors were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach doctrines, the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Again, he forbade me to join any of them. In the face of that revelation and standard of the faith, at least when I was alive, this was the standard of the faith when I was alive or in the church, what, uh, do you, as an active representative of the church today, maintain this view? Uh, that, yeah. that every, yeah. that, and, and let me just explain a little bit more, okay. that a person has to receive the LDS ordinances from a priesthood holder uh -huh. in order to enter into the highest level of exaltation. That's the direct question. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, can I take this or you want to take it? Or? Start it off, I'll follow up. Okay. Pass it um, off. This has been something that's been often brought into questions with me, and I recognize I may be just different, but I remember the very first time I read the First Vision account and Joseph Smith history, and this was um, the quote that I read. And I once had a debate with one of the most prominent Catholic leaders in New York when I was um, doing some uh, entertainment work there. and. I told them, I said that like I, for example, had a problem with the Nicene Creed and the Council of Trent and so on and so forth. And they asked me why and they're expecting some kind of full-throated Mormon rebuttal or whatever. And I said, really, in, in all honesty, I think what Joseph Smith meant and what I think a lot of our aversion to this is, is the fact that the Nicene Creed was voted on. It was voted on. The bishops voted it. And I don't think God communicates to man by vote. Instead, by revelation that becomes inspired scripture. So on the basis of simply not being as revelatory as voted. And by the way, you're free to think differently if you want to. And I'll gladly have a conversation with you on this later. But that's my only real problem. And the idea that if you're going to form a gospel that is going to be the restored church of Jesus Christ, you will be different than all the other existing sects of that time mm -hmm. that are based upon a vote. All of them trace their lineage back to some kind of schism or some kind of break that happened in the first two or three centuries AD based upon some of these creeds. That if you believe God is the head of the church, you can't outvote God, which would inherently be abomination. I understand that's a very heavy word, 
okay? So I don't walk around saying, Sean McCraney, thou art an abomination, yeah. because I believe there's so much progress that's gonna be happening once we die. We are so far from figuring out what's going on in this life that I think there's gonna be plenty of people that are figuring out all kinds of stuff, Mormons included, after we die. Because I push back on, on uh, RFM, I have to push back on you. The question Ready. was, yeah. do you believe that a person has to receive the ordinances from the LDS church priesthood uh -huh. here so, or in the future, just baptism by proxy, temple marriage. Okay, yes. You okay. Um, I would yes, say- It's really yes or no. I, yeah. Yes, with this comma, they has to be done by the authority of God. Okay. Okay. And then I believe because of the truth claims of church that that authority is the church of Jesus so, yes. Christ of Latter-day Saints. All right, Brad. Uh, oh, sorry. This, do you want to? I'm just going to read. Be real, quick. Real quick. That doesn't preclude stuff after we die, though. Mm. Uh, my answer is Doctrine and Covenants 137. I saw Father Adam and Abraham and my father and mother and my brother Alvin that has long since slept and marveled how it was that he had obtained an inheritance in that kingdom, seeing that he had departed this life before the Lord had set his hand to gather Israel the second time. Thus came the voice of the Lord unto me, saying, All who have died without a knowledge of this gospel, who would have received it if they had been permitted to tarry, shall be heirs of the celestial yeah. kingdom of so God. So that's a yes too, though, because they would have received it had they been able to. Well, rece receiving, like if, to receive the gospel doesn't mean just to hear it. Those who are good people who may not have accepted or received the gospel but would have followed it in this life will be heirs of the celestial and, and kingdom I think without all we're any to do, priesthood or bishop oh. laying their hands on them in this life. Right. And Brad? Uh, just to complicate things. Yeah, good job, brother. We're only, we are, we're only doing four minutes. There's only one question left. Cool. Uh, just to complicate things, look at the time that Jos or um, that you have Nephi as the prophet in Third Nephi when Jesus Christ comes to visit them in the Americas. The first thing that he does is baptize them. Nephi was operating as a prophet. I am almost positive he was baptized already. I am not bothered in the least if when Christ returns, we have an additional baptism beyond what we currently have, if we have ordinances and work being done beyond what we have now, mine is a yes. I do believe that we will have these ordinances extended to everybody. I think that it is. A, that's why we do the baptisms for the dead. Right. Why else would we do it if they don't rise and, at all? And I think we're just and, trying, your question, the way it was worded, could be easily perceived as exclusionary. Like, do I view you as somehow lesser in your beliefs? Or do I and, think you will be condemned because you haven't been Mormon or, baptized? Or, or, I don't think that. Or, or you don't think it, but if I have to receive those ordinances in order to gain the highest degree of exaltation, somewhere along the line, uh, then, but, then but it, what you I, really well, are. I'll tell you right but now, what Sean. what I want to get to is this. I think okay. that when you look at the salvation by any other church that they profess, it isn't even the celestial kingdom. Mm. It is the terrestrial kingdom. Mm you will 100% get exactly what you're aiming for without right. the ordinances that God gives. Right. That well, level, I know you believe that. Yes, and, well, and that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah. Well, and also where I'm at with that is, Sean, when you and I present ourselves next to God, I do not think I am going to be, I'm gonna be behind you when it comes to the scoreboard of like, we're all gonna be so screwed when we're presented with what perfection really is. I think any kind of, Huff and puffiness about me being Mormon is going to go away real quick when we present ourselves before God. Got it. So I'm okay answering that question, yes, only because I know I will be just as painfully aware of my flaws as you are. And I'll be like, Sean, that sucked. But I'm glad we're here together. Got it. Thank you for your responses. You have a two minute rebuttal, and then I'm going to give you your question. They'll have a two minute rebuttal and a five minute summary. Thank we're you. Done. Sean, if Cardin's behind you on Judgment Day, don't drop the soap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's bad, man. It's a little prison humor. Sorry, guys. Rachel's um, funny. <laughs> yes, great. Rachel's I didn't say that. It, See, that, was put, the joke. that was the joke. Uh, yeah, you yeah, answer the question. Right. It's fine. Just okay. So anyway, part of the problem here, part of the problem is, is that this is the development of Mormon doctrine, even in the days of Joseph Smith. They've taken section 137, which was given in 1835 or 36 before 1840 when baptism for the dead was revealed. And there's a different process in the Book of Mormon. There's a development. You don't get to, well, the, the mistake that's being made is to go back after the restoration of work for the dead, which is necessary in order to be exalted, and look at an earlier doctrine and say, oh, that's part of the mix still. That's what I perceive as part of the problem. I think it's really, really funny 
that we're talking about voting as establishing God's doctrine as a problem in the early church councils. I went out and I taught what I was told to teach on my mission to Japan, which is that we have a prophet on the earth today who receives revelation from God just like Moses did, and then he gives it to the people. And then over time, I started finding out that the same church that teaches that actually is also giving me hints, President Eyring, that they do the exact same thing. They get in their councils, they talk about things, it moves around the table, they continue to talk about things, eventually they all vote the same way, and that is the definition of revelation in the LDS church today from President Eyring. He was nice enough and candid enough to accidentally let that slip in a press conference. And I think it might have been when uh, President Monson was called as president, I'm not exactly sure. 15 seconds. Okay, uh, section 137, let me just tell you something about that. Where I saw Father Adam, right, and all these other people, including Alvin, Joseph Smith also said he saw Michael in that same vision. He saw Father Adam and Michael. <laughs> that presents a problem for Mormon theology. That's why the Mormon church, when they published that revelation, took out Michael from okay. the language so that it doesn't have that problem and it's another example of them hiding things from you. Last question. <laughs> Last question for RFM. You have four minutes and then two minute rebuttal and then the five minute summation. Oh man. Most people of faith, oh, RFM, if okay. they're mature, ultimately admit that whatever they accept relative to their own metaphysics. I'm sorry, I was fist bumping. I know. What were. were you saying? Something Mo about metaphysics? Yeah, most people of faith admit. Yes. When it when the rubber meets the road, when it comes to any metaphysical belief. Yeah. What we can, what we can't smell, touch, taste, see, right. hear, is a matter of faith. I mean, mo I mean, that bottom line, it comes down to faith, yeah. right? And so with that being the reasonable assumption, how do you justify attacking religion from the basis of logic and reason? Kierkegaard said it's either or. You either, you either approach it through reason and logic, and that's not faith, or it's faith. Mm -hmm. So citing him, how do you justify going after people of metaphysical beliefs even if they can't be proven through logic and reason, with logic and reason. All right, let me ask you a question, because I had you on my show. I'm not debating here! No, I just want to, but as an example, I okay. had you on my show for an hour and a half. It was last December, remember? I do remember. Did I ever once go after your beliefs in that show? You never went after my beliefs in, in that show, no. No, I didn't. You didn't. And I, I want to bring that up, number one, because I just listened to it, and I want to make sure I knew the answer before I asked you. But no, I don't. And when we had Kwaku on in April, you know, there's people on their side who were saying, oh, this is going to be a setup. And there's people on my side who are saying, oh, they're going to be trying to do something here. Uh, and Kwaku's going to be trying to do it. And I said, look, I just want to find out what makes this guy tick. I want to find out what he believes. I wasn't there to be confrontational. I think I succeeded mostly in that. Didn't I? No. Trying to find out what, oh, you thought it was confrontational. It doesn't matter. It just. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but here's the thing. I think that it is very common for people who are atheistic to look at Christianity and say that the worst crimes and mass murders in history were, uh, were committed by Christians, mm -hmm. okay? I think that on the other side of the equation, equally as bad, if not worse crimes, have been committed by people who were atheists. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking Stalin, mm -hmm. okay? okay? It's not about what you believe. It's about believing that what you believe is more important than the welfare of other people hmm. that you are entrusted to look after. Hmm. Whether you're Christian, whether you're heathen, whether you're atheist. And I know that uh, it's been brought up about, what is this about, um, oh, I'm, am I my brother's keeper? The thing about graduating from Mormonism, and I coined the phrase and will continue to use it because it accurately describes my experience, is that it has made me free to actually care about people because, I, because they're people rather than because it's what I'm supposed to do. And it's a huge difference in outlook. I will tell you, I just want to share something very personal. I hope it's okay since Robert Rittner has passed now. You know, we had him on the show. 
It was an incredible experience. I was very honored that I was asked by John DeLynn to be part of the show with world-renowned Egyptologist Robert Rittner. But I stayed in contact with him after the show, and I would call him on occasion. And he was going through that kidney transplant, and we were trying to get him a kidney, right? Well, what happened behind the scenes, which he asked me not to share, was that when he got the call from the hospital, he's hanging by the phone, kidneys any, any time now, right? And he gets the call, goes in, and the reason why is because they tested his blood, and it, he had cancer in his blood. And so the cancer had to be treated before he could go through with the kidney transplant. And it was devastating, as you could imagine, to him. But I would call him on occasion. It's not every week. Maybe every month, every couple of months. I don't want to be a nuisance, but I also want to let him know I care, because I did care about him as a human being. And um, about a month before he passed, I called him, and he was talking. He'd obviously gotten some very bad news, which he didn't really want to share. But he did ask me, will I be remembered? He was so worried about not being remembered. And I assured him, yes, you will be remembered not only for Egyptology, but also for many, many members of this church. And your work on the Book of Abraham has been life-changing in a positive way for them. And that's when I put it up on my webpage and uh, read it, also ran it, to get people to say what they thought about him and what it meant to him. And I directed all that to him. And he told me at the end of that how much it meant to him and that it had really settled his mind. And I did that not because it's what I'm supposed to do as a Mormon or as a Christian or anything. I did it because he's another human being and I cared about him as such and I am my brother's keeper. Two minute rebuttal, five and five. Two-minute rebuttal, oh, and then okay. five-minute summary, summary five-minute summary. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. That is actually a very, that's a very beautiful story, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful you did that. Um, I don't think only ex-Mormons feel that. They love people just because they're people, but the reality is you did state that you do not feel a necessity, or, or you do not feel you need to drive those people whom you have taken out of the faith or shoved out of the faith to another sense of security. That's true. And I, I, I think that's just, I think that's morally wrong. What I think that's morally bankrupt. What should I bankrupt. send them to? The Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, no. <laughs> no, it's I, the reality. I the words of life. <laughs> it, I mean, it's a cute joke, but the reality okay, well, is you have not been living as your brother's keeper. You gave one story for it's emotional effect, but you have not been living as your brother's keeper. Go ahead. Let him talk. Um, I, I guess I would just say that the only real problem I've had with most of tonight, and, and I, I feel bad because you're genuine and you're intelligent. You're very funny. Um, I, I kind of lament that in a different context, I think we could have been friends, and I'd like to envision you as such because I, I think we kind of have that obligation to view each other, <laughs> as C.S. Lewis said, as eternal beings, right? So I'd like to think, at least in this moment as best I can, benevolently, um, and say, I don't know how to refute some of these straw man arguments because they seem to be based on a genuine lived experience other than to testify that those weren't my experiences. I never was taught that just, oh, because you're supposed to, because you're Mormon, you got to <laughs> fake that you love people, you don't. I was never taught that. I was taught that we have a father in heaven and he loves us as individuals and he is keenly aware of each one of our individual flaws and individual situations. And this life is going to be tough. And we're only going to get through it together just because most of life, whether spiritual or secular, is usually made possible because we're doing it with others. And that's the root of my love for people. So when you say like, oh, the Mormon church just guilt trip people and love, that's never been my experience. It's not the experience of Brad. It's not the experience of Quaker Oats. He never would have met it. So it's like, if you felt that way, I'm sorry, brother. I would encourage you. I'll take you out to lunch and I'll buy it at whatever expensive coffee shop you want. And I, I challenge you to a dad joke one-on-one -on -one in whatever coffee shop you want where we see who can make each other break first, if that's what we have to do to bridge this gap. Because I honestly do believe you're, you're fighting demons that are not the same experience I had. And I just want to- I don't think you guys are demons, just so you know. <laughs> Thank you. I, I want to wrap this up by saying, 
<laughs> I, this is a problem that I see within the disagreements that we have between the active LDS community and the ex-Mormon community. I think that there is a lot of difficulty because people feel like the church taught them something that is not the church doctrine, right? I, to, in my eyes, the thing that you said, just like Cardin is saying here, I was never taught by anybody that I should love other people just because I have to. I was taught that other people are children of God, that we are to love one another because we all have intrinsic value. We are brothers and sisters. And I think that sometimes there's, there's difficulty here because you may have had an experience in which somebody taught you something wrong, but it, that doesn't mean that that is church doctrine, right? So I recognize that this is a complex thing, but I think we shouldn't just throw out the church because there are imperfect people in it. Okay. That's the four minute mark, and let's go oh, with shoot. summation argument. Sorry. Summation? No, it's perfect. Yep, you get okay, to summarize you. whatever you want to say, five minutes. I will say it, and I will, I'll just respond to that and say that I don't think I'm the only person who thought that building relationships with non-members had an implicit underlying bargain, which is do it only in order to convert them to Mormonism. And if they are not interested in Mormonism, then we move on to the next, I almost said target, Mark, the next non-member, okay? I don't think I'm the only person. So no, it's not said that way, but it is my lived experience as a, a member of the church, and I don't think I'm alone. Guess what tomorrow is, Sean? I don't know. It's the 14th of November. 42 years ago tomorrow, I entered the Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah, in order to commence my two months of training in Japanese so I could go to Japan to preach the gospel. Today was the day I flew down from Sumner, Washington. We got somebody here from Sumner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody from Sumner is very enthusiastic about it, you can tell. But yeah, I flew down yesterday and I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about this as well. What I was thinking was, let me find this. I made a few notes because you kind of sprung that on us with the five minute summation. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to totally waste it. But I want to give you a guide for all of you faithful members of the church, including those who are on the stage, okay? How not to become like me. How not to leave the church. And the main things are this, okay? First off, don't study. Do not study. Don't look behind the narrative that the LDS Church gives you. Use only the correlated materials that you are given by the church and that you are told by church leaders to use and to not go beyond. So just use those, stick with that. It's also probably best that you don't read your scriptures either. Or if you must, try not to think about them and what they actually mean. Also, number three, do not look behind the church narrative on any of the foundational events of Mormonism. Joseph Fielding Smith, the church historian and apostle in the 1930s, was so disturbed by the fact that the first vision account that he discovered in letter book one, the 1832 account, the earliest account of the first vision that we know of, the one that is written in Joseph Smith's handwriting, mentioned only his seeing one being in his first vision, and that one being was Jesus Christ. It disturbed him so much that he or someone else at his direction cut it out of the letter book, and then he put it in his historian's safe under lock and key for three decades until the 1960s when word of its existence leaked to the public. The Tanners made hay out of it in the press, and under the embarrassment, Joseph Fielding Smith, still alive, was forced to have it put back into the letter book. And you can still see where it's taped into the letter book back in, in the Joseph Smith Papers Project, and then show it to Paul Chessman, who's doing his little master thesis, so he can be the one to bring it to life. A lot of, and I did this too as, a, as a, an apologist, a lot of apologists say, look, it's not a big deal, okay? Just because he says, he only mentioned seeing one doesn't mean he didn't see both, right? What I've got to say in response to that is that your argument is not with me, it's with Joseph Fielding Smith. Because he obviously thought it was a big deal, big enough to take it out and cut it out of a letter book and put it in his safe for three decades. Uh, don't look behind the Book of Mormon translation. 
okay? And if you find out about the seer stone, if you can find the three clicks deep, okay, please don't make the connection that this is exactly what Joseph Smith was doing for many years before in order to try and find buried treasure, okay? Better steer clear of the essays altogether, actually. I understand that those who do find them, it doesn't always go well. Um, so that, that uh, how, how am I doing? 45 for seconds. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, don't look into the Melchizedek priesthood restoration, okay, or when it was that Peter, James, and John's name end up appearing in the record, which is long after. It was supposed to have happened in 1829, and we have early church leaders who say they didn't hear anything about Peter, James, and John until like 1833 from Joseph Smith. Oh, don't look into the Joseph Smith translation and how it borrows from the Adam Clark commentary. Don't look, oh, for heaven's sake, don't look into the Book of Abraham translation. <laughs> and whatever you do, don't listen to any of the 200 episodes at Radio Free Mormon <laughs> dealing with just these subjects in depth, factually based, and hopefully uh, something that we can all learn from. Thank you. Five, five minute summation, you guys. Whoever's going to do it, or if all no, of you are. I'll just take my small portion, and these guys can uh, bat clean up. Um, in response to that, you want to know what? I would offer my summation. Uh, thing number one on that would be actually, instead of not study, study. Study the absolute crap out of Mormonism, every aspect of our history. And what you're going to find if you do not look at it cynically, is a story of people who made drastic sacrifices for their children, for their families, amazing, profound spiritual confirmations of the truth of the gospel. And then I would say, turn around and pray about it so you know or don't know about it yourself, okay? Second thing is read the scriptures. Read the crap out of the scriptures. Actually live up to those primary answers of going to church, reading the scriptures daily, so on and so forth. Second. He said, look behind the narrative. No, our church is wide open when it comes. He's quoting the Joseph Smith papers, a free publication that is allowed online to anybody to see. We are not the Catholic church with a giant archive underneath the papal, uh, 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 the, the papal, I don't even know the word in English. Second is read all of the accounts of the 1832 vision, including the one found by Joseph Fielding Smith, all five of them, because what you will find is a prophet as he spiritually matured, began to understand his experiences better, and that will be a type and a shadow for you. As you spiritually mature, you will probably recognize some of these experiences better. Second is read the essays. I'd say read the crap out of the essays. Read them, because a lot of people prayed about them and they'll introduce you to topics you need to wrestle with. But then, after you've read them, pray about them. Because at the end of the day, it's not about what the scholars think. That helps. It's about your individual relationship with God. And then third, I would say listen to RFM. Listen to the crap out of RFM. And then listen to us. And see if you think one leads to cynicism and nihilism, or if one leads to faith and then choose yourself. How much time? You got uh, two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. I'll try to make it quick. I think that the core thing I want to get across to people from all of this is that we are responsible for how we view the world. We need to decide what it is that we're going to do. We need to choose today who we will serve. Look into Moroni chapter 10, read the very beginning. I think we oversimplify it a little bit too much too often. You look at what it says, and it says to when you have read these things, when you receive them, consider how merciful God has been unto the children of men from the time of Adam up until this time. And that when you study these things, and when you pray about these things, and you ask God with faith in Jesus Christ to know that these things are true, then you will know of their truth. And it is the Holy Ghost that will teach you the truth of all things to your heart and your mind. This will enable you to overcome cynicism and overcome doubt and come to know your Father in heaven. I know he lives, and I hope that you come to know him as well, just as you can come to know Christ. He's really nice. I feel like if I follow that, I'll, I'll sound like a jerk, but- <laughs> It's all um, good. Uh, I also, I just wanna say that you saw a lot of different 
positions here tonight, but ultimately the position that matters the most is the one where you walk away knowing you have divine worth and that you are an eternal being and that the society you live in is a society worth saving and worth fighting for and that our Judeo-Christian heritage and our Abrahamic heritage actually matters. And if you give in to secularism, you're letting all of those things go. And we do not want to live in a society in which the fabric of everything we've enjoyed is going to be ripped out in front of our future children and our grandchildren. Mormonism, as RFM calls it, is incredibly important and it's a fabric that we need. Whether you believe or not, giving into the anti-Mormon tirade of bitterness and hatred will not make you a complete person. You know that and I know that. And I want you to come to Jesus, whether that's socially or emotionally or spiritually, it will make you a better person and we all need it. Or with the Kanye West album, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you guys. Uh, hey, that was my reference and nobody laughed. Should I made a boomer reference? <laughs> <laughs> Kanye, man, that was good. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you, uh, really, truly. I think you've been uh, honest with who you are, and I think you've been um, articulate, and I think the mind power sitting on that stage is amazing. And uh, I would just encourage, because it's my place and I'm the moderator, uh, toward love. And that's selfless, agape love. That's kind and gentle and merciful, forgiving, long-suffering, patient. And uh, that you brothers, you are all for my brothers, that you will um, extend that mercy and patience and long-suffering to each other. Um, that, that's the final thing. We have food in the back. Can I say something? Well, I guess you can. Because you, I want to thank you for hosting yeah. this event. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, you guys. You have done you have done an incredible job. You have a wonderful place, and I want to thank all three of the Midnight Mormons for showing up, because there was another a friend of mine who said they're not showing up, and I said I think they will. I said no way. So I said you want to bet? I said yeah. What? Well, a hundred bucks. I'll bet they'll show up. So I won because you guys showed up. I won a hundred bucks. All right. <laughs> And I'm donating it. I don't want your filthy no, to the campus church. From and Cameron. I encourage everybody else to make contributions <laughs> you, to this great church tonight. And I'm going to give this to you later if you don't take it, I'll mail it to you. I cannot receive filthy lucre from Cameron. <laughs> you can get anything you want in this world for money. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. No, it's there not. you go. Um, is gonna buy a big bottle of vodka tonight. <laughs> Enjoy the food. Stay. Okay. Gentlemen. We are bound, my friend. Bound? Bound we for hell? To, we went to the fire you, okay? you look really hot. I, I'm overheating for sure. I mean attractive. Oh. No. <laughs> no, it's very hot. I want a group hug. Oh, right now. All right. All right. right now. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I don't know which one of us is aroused, but it's not me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I think we were on. You can totally lie there. Far. <laughs> yeah, well, from that say. far away, it must have been me.